You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. Picked the kids up from school and we just went. Had some friends that were like, you've got a place to go, we just went there. And they just put it out. <laughs> Probably it's been the toughest period of my of my life. Um by by any stretch of the imagination, but I think I'm I'm just in a place where I could I can speak now, you know? When those guys were chasing me down the road with those knives and all that kind of stuff and blah blah blah, blah and they're baying for my blood, they're like, we just want we just want to get you, we just want we just want you out of here, we just want the industry is exactly the same. I don't need to answer that. We, we know the answer to that. I don't need to answer that. We know the answer to that. And then I start seeing my harasser, my convicted harasser, the guy that's been harassing my family for 10 years and putting out this narrative that I've been bullying him. Like, right. And I, I don't know why I've let this go for all this time, but I have done. Getting the phone call from the Guardian, it wasn't just one accusation, it was 20. So you're trying to paint you as a Harvey Weinstein character. I can hold my hands up and go, ah, do you know what? Did you ever say something inappropriate to that person say, yeah maybe or did you you know have you ever in your years have you ever tried your luck with someone yeah maybe do you know what I mean that doesn't make you a sexual predator I carried the knife in my pocket for like six weeks and then there was one day I was just like yeah this is the day man I think they were going for a walk or whatever and I was like yeah this is the day what about with Ashley Walters who you've worked with through the years who you've been tight with like, how did that go with him did he have your back he did not. Boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got Noel Clark. Noel, how, how are you, brother? I'm, I'm okay, man. How you doing? Yeah, good, thanks. Good. First and foremost, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Phenomenal career. Actor, director, producer. Yeah. But you've done it all, man. Brock blockbuster films yeah coming from nowhere and to being yeah. one of the most successful actors writers britain's produced man yeah. from such a young age as well you won a bafta it kind of <laughs> life seemed to be at the top you seem to be everything 20 yeah. years of hard work seemed to have been unlocking all the doors but then as soon as you win that bafta bang yeah the dark clouds come over yeah accusations left right and center 20 accusations all nasty stuff which we'll touch on but first and foremost, how are you? I'm all right. I'm all right, man. I yeah. mean, I'm getting some greys in the beard, you know. But but I'm okay. Yeah, I'm okay. It's been it's been tough. It's been a it's been a a, a whirlwind. It's been like probably the uh, not probably it's been the toughest period of my of my life, um, by by any stretch of the imagination. But I think I'm I'm just in a place where I could. I can speak now, you know. Fair play. Every man deserves a chance to speak. In. Yeah, I've not had that, weirdly. Uh, Surprising. This, that. this is a perfect platform to do so, bro. Yeah. So, but before we get into everything, I always go back to the start of my guests. Yeah. Get a bit of understanding about you. Yeah. Where you grew up and how it all began. Yeah, so I grew up in, um, I grew up in Lavin Grove, which is, you know, now, now is, is labelled all part of Notting Hill. But I grew up in a sort of the Grenfell Tower bit, which, you know, if people know, is still quite an underfunded area. Everyone knows about the Grenfell Tower fire, right? And everybody sits there baffled about how that particular area can be the, one of the most underfunded in the country, sitting within the richest borough in Europe. So can you imagine when I grew up there, it was not like a walk in the park. It was a, a pretty rough area. You know, it was um, just riots every, every year at Carnival. There was fights all the time. My friends were just doing, my friends were just doing, as I, as I grew up, for some reason, I was just kind of, you know, I liked comics, I liked movies. I was like sort of, it's so hard to describe because I was kind of like the nerd kid, but I was still one of them. Do you know what I mean? So like I was the one, um, I was the one that didn't want to, and as we grew up, I was the one that kind of didn't want to rob and didn't want to do that kind of stuff. But I was the one where, <clears throat> you know, you know, a lot of my friends were, were, were stabbing, robbing, occasionally shooting, doing bad shit, going to jail. And I was the one that not only didn't want to do it, but I could tell them. And I don't know why, you know, one of my friends who's, who got a 25 year sentence said to me, 
I wish I'd had your strength. And I'm like, I said to him, it, it wasn't strength. I don't know. I don't know why I was like that. I don't know why I was called the coward, but yeah, I was like that. I was, can you imagine this, right? So you're the guy that doesn't want to rob, doesn't want to shoot, doesn't want to stab, doesn't want to smash and grab, doesn't want to do all that stuff. And you're able to tell your friends you don't want to do it, but you're the coward. Like, make that make sense. Do you know what I mean? And now we're all older. They're like, man, you were so strong. And I'm like, I, it wasn't strength. I don't know why I was like that. I've just always been one of those people that is maybe defiant or maybe kind of, I just knew what I didn't want to do. But the area I grew up in was like, was just, was just bad. You know, if you're a friend, you know, you, you, you couldn't really have friends because your friends were all part of that same sort of world. And if your friends looked at you and be like, yo, I like your shoes. They didn't like your shoes. They wanted your shoes. And you had to be able to be like, I'm glad you like them, but you're not having them. You know what I mean? There's peer pressures in those areas, same as Glasgow. That I always portrayed myself as a clown because I, I didn't want to be angry. I could act that part yeah. and, and pretend. But when you go down that route, then I had to take drinking drugs to then right. give me confidence to be angry or be something that I wasn't. Yeah, yeah. And when that boy who's doing 25 years saying it's a strength, it is a strength to say no. Yeah. It's a strength to okay, say I don't want to be the same as everybody else. You're right, but it, it's what I, I guess what I mean is like, I didn't see it as a strength because I didn't know why I was doing it. I just knew, like, I'm not doing that. And, you ain't, and you're not making me do that. And so when you say, like, you had to take all those things to be angry, I was angry. I was like, have you ever seen the, the Avengers where, mm -hmm. the first Avengers where Hulk, they go to Hulk at the, you know, near the end for the battle. Come on, you're going to turn into Hulk. And, you know, come on, what's your secret? And he goes, that is my secret. I'm always angry. It's like, <laughs> I was always ready to go. Like, I was one of them. They're like, let's rob these guys. I'm like, I don't want to, why? I don't want to do that. You know, I remember one time some guy wouldn't move out of my cousin's, this is when we're teenagers, like 16 or whatever, some guy wouldn't move out of my cousin's <laughs> flat. So, you know, standard thing comes around like, yo, this guy doesn't want to move out of my place. Can we go deal with him? Boom, all jump in the car. And it's like a movie. It's like that boys and we all jump in the car, we get there and we're about to roll upstairs and deal with this guy. And one of my friends goes, no, nah, you stay here. You stay downstairs. And I'm like, why? And he says, because... You're the only one we think could probably get out of this. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, you're just the, you're the one that I think, you know, there's better for you. Let us do it. And, you know, then we can go back home. And I was like, but I want to I come. I want to come. But not only was I sort of generally the coward, the times when I maybe did want to, they kind of just knew. Some of them knew like, nah, you're the one we think can get out of this life. They could see it as well. Like in Goodwill Hunting where they say, you know, to Matt Damon, you're the one that can, I don't know. And I, it wasn't strength for me. It, I, I don't know. I'm just defiant. I'm, I'm a disruptor. Why is that? Does that come from mum or dad? Well, dad wasn't really, it's my mum. My mum came to this country in 69. She studied nursing. She was asked things like, did she live in trees? She was asked, she was called monkey. She was called everything under the sun. And she was the only one, and she wasn't one of the only black nurses because there's a lot, but she was very light skinned. So like people like half breed, like all sorts of, every sort of thing you could imagine. And I guess she became defiant. She put up like this shield and she became defiant. <laughs> she, she's still to this day a defiant woman. And I think it's come from her. It just came from her. And it wasn't like taught, it was absorbed. Do you know what I mean? It's just like, I saw how, I guess I saw how she was. And so, when friends of mine were like, right, well, let's rob these guys. Or I remember one time, one Halloween, I did rob some guys and I felt so bad I took the stuff back. We found, we spent half the, half the night looking for them to take the stuff back because I was like, it's not me. It's just not me. And so that was who I was. And my friend said, let's do this. I'm like, I'm not doing it and you can't make me. Who were you at school? Average. Not very, not very academic. I was more into comics and, and films and I just, it's interesting because you know, one of my boys and I, we just sort of di diagnosed with dyslexia and, and slight attention um, things. Deficit. Yeah, slight. I can't, not, it's not ADHD, it's something. But my mum says I'm most like him. And when I look at the things he does and he winds, drives me nuts, man, defiant, I think to myself, that's me. I don't tell him. <laughs> Obviously, I'm like, you listen to me, boy. I don't tell him, but I'm like, that's me. And I, I, do, I do wonder because I was told 
a lot as I got older. I think you're on the spectrum. I think you're on the spectrum, but I've not been diagnosed with anything. See, with your comics and stuff, did you have to hide that from your friends or the potential could have been no, bullied, slagged care. off? I didn't or did care. they know? I think, yeah, they knew because, again, and this is where he says it's strength, and I'm like, strength. If someone said, ah, ah, you've, I mean, you got comics, and like, oh, I don't give a fuck, so what? And then they would be like, ah, and I'd be like, so what? And then they kind of like, you, you take the, they take the power away from them. Do you know what I mean? And if people were like, sometimes there were occasions where, you know, people would be like, bro, come on, man, let's do this. Let's do this. Let's do that. And I'm like, I'm not doing that. Bro, you know what? If you, if you ain't, if you're not doing that, then I don't see why you should even be with us. I'd be like, cool. I got toys and comics and Nintendo at home. I just go home then. I was never, I think that's a key thing for me. I was never afraid to be on my own. If you're never afraid to be on your own and no one's got power over you, peer pressure doesn't work on you because I'm like, I can just go home and play Super Mario on Nintendo and sit there, I'll sit there all day. I don't need to be out here with you pretending to, pretending to smoke or whatever like that. I've, I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't, don't do drugs. I've never touched any of that. When all, my, when all my friends started doing that stuff, I didn't do any of it. Never did. See, I needed to be around people. I needed people there. I needed new girlfriend. I needed new friends. I could party with anybody. I just needed to be feel part of something. And then it's not until my later years where I'm getting more attention than ever, but I'm more of a recluse. Yeah. Was your comics and stuff, was that how your creative mind started? Like, I guess kind so. Kind of visualisation and how you ended up in the journey you ended up on? Yeah, my mum worked a lot. Right, so my dad, you know, he'll be fuming because like he's the best, he's the best granddad. And I'll say that he's the best granddad, like my boys love him, but you know, he, he just weren't there. Like he can't, you know, he's, he's got his own, what do they call it? He's got his own reality now, but he weren't there, right? So my mum, my comic, my mum works a lot. So from a young age, I was going to school on my own, like from seven. I've got a seven year old now. I wouldn't, I wouldn't send him up the road to Sainsbury's because he's seven and he would probably get run over. But at seven, I was going to school on my own, just coming back on my own. Um, my mum would work shifts. She had to, she had no choice. It's not like now her parents get in trouble because they leave the kids. Like back then you, you had to work and she had to feed us. So she would do late shifts and late shifts would be from like 12 to eight or whatever. So I would have to come home with my little keys, come in the house, put the chain on, my snacks are laid out. So I just spent time reading the comics, looking at movies, watching movies. You know, that's, that's all I did. That's all I, from a young age, from, from about seven or eight, I knew what I wanted to do because I just, look at TV like that and read my comics and just like, I knew what I wanted to do. And, and that's just who I was. And at the same time, you know, when I was with my friends, when they were like doing bad shit, I just, I, I could always go back to that. I could always go back to that, go home, watch wrestling, play Nintendo, um, and, and read comics. And these are all things, again, going back to possibly spectrum -y stuff. These are all things I still do. Like I still read comics. I still, love films i still i still play video games and i still watch wrestling to is this that, day is that like an escape for you with that stuff i like think a comfort it, blanket maybe? yeah like, yeah i think with patterns it's with patterns you know i've done therapy now with patterns it's it's comfort isn't it it's a pattern so like sometimes i you know I, i'm a wwe guy i watch it consistently i've watched it for 30 years now sometimes i'm not even watching it but i'm watching it i'll be writing a script and it's just there in the background it's like it's like comfort for me because when i was a little boy Mum was working late, I come on switch on the TV. It's interesting because when I went to therapy and I spoke to them, I said to them, I was on my, always on my own, always on my own. And they said, well, what did you do? I said, come on, turn on the TV and blah, blah, blah. And to this day, whenever I travel and I go to a hotel room, the first thing I do is turn on the TV. And the therapist said, well, I challenge you that you weren't always alone. I said, what are you talking about? I said, I was alone all the time. She said, but you're a grown man now and still the first thing you do when you go into a hotel room is turn on the TV. Why'd you do that? I was like, Bleh. it's a comfort, it's a comfort blanket. It's because when I was alone at home, my mum wasn't there, I turned the TV on, so I wasn't alone. Films and TV and those things were in my ear, just in the background. And to this day, I can't work in silence. If I'm at home writing a script or whatever like that, I cannot work in silence. If the kids are running around or if the TV's on, I'm cool. But if it's silent, it drives me mad. How, how hard was it with your dad not being around? Very. Very, just every, you know, you go around to other people's, go around to other people's houses and their dads were there and you just kind of like, why is mine not there? We do sports day and it's the dad's racing and, and you got to run with Mrs. Battersby 
<laughs> Do you know what I mean? Who's 94 years old and can't run and you come last and then so you start. It shaped me in a way that, sorry, I don't know why my nose is itching. It shaped me in a way that I find it hard to articulate, but I know it did because when I became a dad, I won every sports day race. Every time there was a dad's race at sports day, I won it. And I'd be like, son, I won the race, son. And they'd be like, oh, butterflies, they didn't care. But it wasn't what I've understood now, it wasn't about them. It was about me because my dad didn't do any sports day races. He was never there. So when I had kids, I won every race thinking it was for them. I'm here, I'm here, son, look, I'm here. But now knowing inside through therapy, that actually was kind of for me. Okay, the a fulfillment. A fulfillment, that. but also like showing your kid, showing your son that I'm, I'm here. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? When did you get into acting? Why? When, as I said, it was just something I always wanted to do. And then we go to, and then I also did physical, phys physical education. So, um, I, I, I followed that route through, you know, PE and A level PE. And then, and then I worked in the gym, you know, I was a hustler around, around the area. I was a hustler as well. What I mean by that is I basically, I learned very early on, like, wait, hold on. So, you know, like buy one, get one free, like, so. I realized that if I didn't want to rob people and didn't want to do what my friends are doing, I didn't want to end up in jail like they were, then I had to find new ways to, to get things. So I was like, well, I'm going to earn them. And I heard that if you worked in the local sports center, they would always help you out. Like, cause they wanted to help people in the community. So if you worked in there and then you wanted to progress, they would pay for half of whatever you wanted to do. So I was like, so hold on. So if I need a hundred pounds to pay for a course, they'll pay 50 pounds of it. And then I can still earn and buy my trainers or whatever. Yeah. So I was like, cool. So I started working in a sports center. At first I was just doing a bit of cleaning. Right. And, and trust me, it's not something that you, you, you want to do. I'm not, I didn't want to do that, but I thought it's a way in. Then it was the, the water slide attendant. You know, I took that very seriously. Water slide attendant. You're like, wait, go, go. <laughs> do you know what I mean? So I did that. And, but my goal was always like get in the gym. And then they paid for half my lifeguarding course. So I did my lifeguarding course. Then I was a lifeguard for a lot of years. Then they paid for half my gym instructor course. And I was a gym instructor and I was a trainer. And that was always my goal. So I was doing that on the side. And then in that gym, I met someone who was a director and they gave me an opportunity. By this point, I'm like 20. And they, they gave me an opportunity to audition to, for something. And I auditioned for that, that role, um, metrosexuality in, I don't remember what year, 97, 98. And I got that job and that's how the acting, that's how the acting came through. But in the sports center, man, I was just like, I'm just gonna work. I'm just gonna work. I just wanted to earn everything. I just wanted to earn everything. Like I didn't want to rob or, or anything like that. You know? Did you have it in your mind when you're doing acting where you wanted to go? Was it just, again, something to just keep busy, keep away from the bad stuff? Or did you have a vision that you were going to be something? <clears throat> did you have that belief ingrained into you from your mum? Did she ever ingrain that into you? Or did you see her struggle, what she went through? and? how hard it was in there? The second, probably, I saw I saw how hard the struggle was. I saw it was like just us. And I saw the, the struggle. When you're from where I'm from, there's a level of self-belief and self-confidence you have to have to survive. If you don't have that, you succumb to the peer pressure and you end up like a lot of my friends, right? I had to have confidence to say, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing this. And so, that level of self-belief and self-confidence is something I've taken with me. It's plagued me my whole life because people are always like, he's so arrogant. It's like, so fucking what? Like, mind your business. But for me, I never saw it as arrogance and I don't think I'm arrogant because I've never believed I'm better than anybody. I've never believed I'm better than any other human being in the world. I treat billionaires the same way I treat waiters. Like, I don't, I, I'm, I'm nice to everyone I meet, like, as far as I'm concerned. You fall out with people, short, whatever. But I'm nice to everyone I meet, right? But there's a level of self-confidence and self-belief you have to have. When I started acting, I told the guy that got me started, I said, I'm going to be the best. No one's going to stop me. I'm going to be the best. And he said, well, you have to move to America. I said, no. Nah. I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay here. So I'm around my mum. I'm going to stay here and I'm going to get to the top in this country. And this was, this is, you're talking 1997. He'll, he'll probably remember this conversation. I told him I'm going to be the best. I believe I can be the best. Doesn't believe, don't mean I'm better than any other human, but I know my work ethic. 
I know how I hustle. I know how I take opportunities. And so I'm going to be the best here. And I believe that. You can't say that and not believe it. How many roles did you play before you got a part of Doctor Who? So I started in 2000. Doctor Who was 2000. And we shot it in 2004. So I played a few roles like... Oh, I'll tell you what, big one. I did Avi the same pet was a big one I'd done. Um, but before that, it was just um, small, yeah, small, few small roles. And, you know, but by that point I was writing because again, with the, the being socially kind of smart, if not academically, when I got into acting, within a few months, I realized, you know, I've said I'm going to be the best, but I realized I'm not going to get where I want to get. I can, I can just tell there's this, Maybe my spectrum stuff, you know, I'm self-diagnosing, but something was telling me like, you can't get where you want to get because there's barriers here. So you have to find a different way. What sort of barriers? I could just see it. The roles I was going for were like robber number three and, you know, thief number four or, you know, Tyrone or or whatever. There were certain roles that, you know, when I was like, well, I want to be, I want to be James. Well, you can't be James because James is, James is, it says James, brown hair and brown eyes. Well, yeah, but. Can't they just, well, why can't I be James? They can change that. When, they can't change it. Like it was very, so I was like, I don't get that. I'm just going to start writing my own. I'm just going to start writing my own shit. You know what I mean? So in the background, I was writing a film that was based on where I grew up and was based on my area. I just started writing. And, and, and again, with the writing, I'd never written a script in my life. I mean, I'd done A-level media in, in college and all that, but so what I did was, was I went to, there was a bookshop called Books, etc. It's before Waterstones and all that. I went to Books, etc. And I bought every screenplay they had in there. Every screenplay. American Beauty, Clerks, Chasing Amy, you know, uh, Memento, Almost Famous. Every screenplay. To get an understanding of understanding, yeah. And I sat down and read them all. Read them all, sat in my room, laid them all out and read them all and just sort of started seeing the patterns. Okay, this film's different to this film, but still at 25 pages, some, at 10 pages, something happens here and that kicks off the story. And I just read them all, just read them all. But I just bought them. I just bought them all and I read them and read them. And then I started writing. Okay, I thought, was that the, did you write stuff before that? I wrote a few things before that, um, that I've never seen the light of day, but Kid Hood was, was, was the one I was just working on. Yeah. How long did it take to write? Well, the first 40 pages were like two days. Because it was one of those ones where I'd been thinking about it for a while. It was people I knew. It was an area I knew. It was where I grew up. And I just remember getting up one day, like three o'clock in the morning, and just sitting down and writing. And I wrote like 40 pages. And then I wrote 40 pages. It's like, yeah, this is easy. And then I was like, fuck, I'm stuck. Then it took me a few months <laughs> to work out the rest. See, when you're doing writing a script for a movie, like, especially if it's your first one, does things just come to you through the day, through your sleep, sitting in the toilet? Like, yeah. But if you're in mind, how does it work? My mind's like that. I just get inspired by the, the weird. I could be sitting on the tube and, and see, I could be sitting on the tube and see someone with a hearing aid and I'll just think about, how have they, how did that happen? Were they born like that? Did it happen? And then my mind goes off. My mind works like that. But with Kid Outwood, it was like, that was so, you know, I can't, you know, people, people think they know me. People don't know me, man. You know, I wasn't, as I said, I wasn't like my friends, but you know, I, I was, I had friends of mine that were getting, you know, you left school and people just rolled up in cars and attacked them with bats and stabbed them in the eyes with, with, with standing knives. I had friends that, you know, I worked with that stepped on trainers in clubs and got shot. Like I, I was, I was chased by 30 fucking well, they thought they were triads, but I, I don't know, like, you know, outside Hippodrome with knives and machetes. Do you know what I mean? Like down the road and had to run. Me and my friends had to run. And then I still called them up and I met them the next day. I said, come meet me the next day then if you're back. And then they were like, what? And only one of them came and it was me and this guy sitting there. And I'm like, you chased me with knives and what? what, you, what? And he was like, nah, bro, it was this and that. We think you did this. We think you did that. And we heard this and we heard that. It's the story of my life. We heard this, we heard that. And you know what I mean? But now that I'm sitting opposite you, I think we would probably get on. I said, well, I don't want to get on. I just don't want to be chased by your guys with nice <laughs> stuff like that. And we never, never bothered each other again. But I don't know why I did that. Why would you do that? 
And this is who this is this is who who I am though. I don't know. Like the, the night before, those guys chased me down the road, and I was just fuming. I was like, I told this girl I know. I'm like, you call them up, you tell them I meet him. And I went, why did I do that? I can't explain it to you. But that's just kind of sometimes who I feel I am. I'm impulsive, and so you know, kidhood was based on stuff that I knew. See when you get called up for Doctor Who, like, what was the process to get onto that? It's like one of the biggest shows in UK. Like, it was just um, just standard. Just acting, just auditioning and and it came up and my agent was like, Do you want to audition for Doctor Who? And I remember the last time it was on, I was like, Ooh, it wasn't great the last time it was on, but um I knew I was getting that job. Oh so? I just knew. The, the confidence or the arrogant, whatever people want to label it, I knew I was getting that job. There, there, there was no way I wasn't getting that job. Do you know what I mean? Like you can never know, but I'm like, I'm getting this job. I'm getting this job. Same as when I did Avi the same pet with all those big actors. I'm like, I'm getting this job. And I went into Doctor Who and 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 I got that job. And interestingly, you know, going back to what I said earlier about, you know, and obviously there's people that would dispute this, but going back to what I said earlier about being nice to people. A few years before that, I'd done one episode of Holby City. Or two episodes when I just played this character who dies or whatever like that. Spoilers for anyone who hasn't seen it. And the director, <laughs> years ago, the director on that job was a guy that, I don't, I don't know, and I'm not, you know, talking bad about people, but it seems like the, the main cast on the, he wasn't having a good time. He wasn't having a good time. You know, I think, you know, directors just come in and out of that stuff and sometimes, and I don't know if he was winding people up, he wasn't having a good time, but I was only there for that episode. I got on with him really well. I was nice to him and I, I remember him having a bad time. I said, you're right, mate. And he said, yeah, yeah, I'm good. And, you know, thanks for asking and all that kind of stuff. And went about my business, did my thing episode, never saw him again. Then Doctor Who comes up, I'm like, I'm getting this job. I, I know I'm getting this job. You know, I don't know what you believe, but I'm like, I'm getting this job. All right. And I walk into that audition and he's the director. He's a director. And I do my audition and I smash it out of the park because I knew I'm getting it. But when I smashed it at the end, I said, all right, thanks for having me. See you later. And he looks at me and he goes, well done. And he looks, winks at me, well done, or winks at me. And I'm like, I'm getting this job. What happens when you get it, like a kid from the streets to then being in one of the biggest shows in the U U UK, like, how was that feeling? Did you ever feel accomplished? Did you ever feel Never. life was good? Or did you always feel something was missing? Always. This is very interesting. I know this is an interesting one because it's something that I've worked on in therapy as well is I never celebrated anything. Why? Never feel good enough? Because, I don't know, because I expected it. I've already said, I said I was gonna be the best. So like, I didn't celebrate anything. I just, I'm like, this is, I've worked for it. I've worked for this. Like I didn't like, I didn't go in there and get lucky. So it's interesting because when when I was in the process, they were talking about depression and talking about the levels of depression and how people get. And I, we, I was talking about the levels of depression, how people get highs and lows and all that kind of stuff. And they said, Do you, have you ever felt really celebrated stuff? I said, it's weird. I never celebrated anything. All the premieres of my things that I went to, I wouldn't really, it looked like I celebrate. I go there, get my picture taken, watch a film. The moment the film left, I barely went to the after parties. I was probably not there. I don't drink, don't drink. I, I, I didn't there. I would get a group of close friends and we'd go to a restaurant up the road. I'd sit, eat and I'd go home. Never celebrated anything. The next morning I was back in the office. I never celebrated anything, but also I never felt really down about anything. Like if I didn't get jobs, I'd be like, fuck it, so what? Like mm. I never was super devastated about anything. So in therapy, we're talking about it. I'm talking about the ups and downs of um of depression. And I tell them, they say to me, and I said, nah, I've never felt, I said, I've never celebrated anything really. And I never get super down anything. And they look at each other like that and look back and they go, that's the very definition of depression. I'm like, what? I said, I don't get that. And they were like, you're numb. You're numb to everything. And I never looked at it that way. But when I think about it now, I think sometimes I was numb to everything. I never... That's why it didn't bother me about my friend. I don't care. And I never celebrated like, 
man, I don't really know why. I just, I just think I've expected, like I said, I'm going to succeed. I'm going to succeed. I didn't, I didn't, when I was growing up, I didn't have anything to celebrate anyway. So like, I didn't, I never saw that. I wasn't around that. My mum did birthday things for me, but I wasn't around that. It wasn't like I had massive part. I'm, I did occasionally, so I can't fib, but it wasn't like I had massive parties all the time. And like, so I never really, I had no family here. All my mum's sisters are in Toronto or New York. So we went out celebrating other people's birthday party. Like I, I never, I wasn't around that stuff. So I never really celebrated anything. Do you know How what is mean? that when you do therapy and they tell you that you're numb to it? Does that, does that make you feel sad that all the achievements you did have and you never really celebrated them to then be happy from what you're achieving? Like you've always probably had that pressure or always something that internally missing where you just, no matter what you achieved in life, you no, would have never have felt fuck all. You could have won an Oscar and you're thinking. I wouldn't, yeah, I would have been like, if I'd won an Oscar, which I, I fully believe I would have eventually, especially after the one I just got, after if the, what happened didn't happen. Um, I would have, the next, I would have, uh, same thing would have happened. It's the same thing that would always happen. I would have just put it down and gone, all right, how do I get the next one? And so, did it make me feel sick? <laughs> Ironically, it didn't make me feel sad because that's the whole point. I didn't really feel, but it made me go. When they told me that in therapy, I was like, that makes sense. It makes sense. So like, I kind of was like, I get it. You know, and they really broke down about it. If you've never been around it and you never saw it, like it, 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 I guess it did make me a little bit kind of like, yeah, why? Why? I never celebrate. I never was like, man, we, we've done this amazing thing. Let's have two days off or anything. Like that. Next morning, back in the office put it on the shelf. How do I get another one? What's next? What's the new goal? What else are you going to tell me I can't do? Do you feel as if you're always trying to prove to someone? Yeah. Who? I don't know. I think like, it's interesting you said about wanting to be accepted. It's like, I never cared, but I think deep down, there was a, deep down there was a thing about like, I just always wanted to be accepted as who I am. Don't ask me to rob people. I don't, just accept me. Just accept me like, I'm your guy that, I'll be here with you, I'm your mate, but if you're gonna go do that, don't ask me, just go do it. I mean, don't do it obviously, but you know, I'm not judging them. If, if you're gonna do that, just do it. Don't ask me to do it. And I think I just wanted that acceptance subconsciously. So when I get into the industry subconsciously, you know, all I heard, all I heard from the beginning was you can't do that. Oh, that, you can't do that. That won't happen. That's all I heard in the industry. This won't happen. That won't happen. You can't do this. You can't do that. So I'm like, in my mind, I'm like, I'm going to do everything. I'm going to do everything. Mm -hmm. I literally remember one time coming out of an audition and people going, oh, he's quite intense. So I will never watch anything he's in. It just doesn't. And I heard that. It was one of those lifts where you have to, the metal lift and you have to wait for it. And I heard them talking behind the door. Oh yeah, I yeah, will never watch anything he's in. You know, I hope he doesn't get into the business. Something, something. I'm not paraphrasing. And in my mind, I was like, if you're not going to watch anything I'm in, you better never buy a television. I'm going to be on everything. If you don't want me in your business, I'm going to take over your whole business. That was my, my, my mindset was always like, you're going to accept me. You're going to accept me. Do you know what I mean? And it's that mentality from, you know, you take that kid who can tell his friends, like, I ain't doing that. And you put him in a, an office with a movie exec who says, your script has to be like this. And he goes, I ain't doing that. Same kid, same phrase, different environment. You get labeled difficult, you get labeled chippy, you get labeled aggressive and you're not, you're just surviving. Is that whole industry like that? Or did you feel it more being the black kid from London? Is it's that, like, it's is like much race involved or is the whole industry just ruthless where people are nasty bastards behind the scenes? The latter. The latter. On top of that, I'm then black and I'm working class. I'm not one of those guys who holds up the race card like, it's class as well, it's class as well. I'm not just, I'm not just black, but I'm not a guy that's like, I'm not a houseboy. I'm not a guy that's just going to do what people say and toe the line and all that. So you're kind of, you know, you're working class as well. So, you know, you, you, When those guys, there's a point to this. When those guys 
were chasing me down the road with those knives and all that kind of stuff and blah blah blah, blah. and they're baying for my blood. They're like, we just want, we just want to get you. We just want, we just want you out of here. We just want. To... The industry is exactly the same. Everyone's vying for that top position. Everyone wants to take over. Everyone wants to do this. Everyone wants to. That's exactly the same. The difference is these guys will look you in the eye and tell you, "We're going to get you." These guys will smile at you and go, "Oh, that was wonderful." And when you turn your back, then they get you. That's that's the difference. So, see, when you're in Doctor Who and then you've produced a Kid Hood, yeah. that was in the same year. That was two thousand six, two thousand seven. Yeah, I didn't produce Kid Hood; just wrote it and and was in it. But yeah, that was in the, that was in the same year. Did that help being in Doctor Who? Did that open more doors for you? Um. Not as much as it would have if I didn't look and sound like me. Do you know what I mean? Like, it, you know, you come out of Doctor Who and, you know, you, you, it's interesting, it's difficult, but, you know, you come out of Doctor Who and certain people go become stars and other people it kind of, you know, and, and that does come down to class and it does come down to what you look like and where you're from and, and stuff like that. But, you know, if I didn't have Kid Hood at the time, excuse me, my career might have stalled after that. But because I had Kid Hood, as well, that kind of took me off in a, in a different direction. direction. Yeah. So being in Doctor Who, you're expecting more doors to open, like because they always mention race, they always mention color, and yeah. this and that. Because were you not one of the first black actors to ever be on Doctor yeah, Who? Yeah, the well? first black companion. Yeah. Yeah. Did you? Is that what is that then? Like, is race a massive involvement in this industry? Or is, talent or what is it then it's missing did you what is it you well they, they they pretend it isn't but but it is yeah mm -hmm. um but again I, I didn't care i didn't care like I, I'm, I'm not being one of those guys that's touted this that and the other i've just gone with it because you still got on doctor who you still got on yeah do you know what i mean you were on yeah. what five years yeah total i did like two seasons and then i was kind of off and came back for one episode and yeah yeah so see when you're in that kind of bbc massive show and then go and do a kid outhood like that's totally different totally to the different. spectrum like yeah. were you ever told don't do that or were you thinking this is the next path i'm going to take i'm just thinking this is what i'm doing like i was never i didn't again comes back to like i didn't care what people told i didn't care what people said about don't do this i kind of i got to a I'm just a weird guy, man. Like I just, I'm just a weird guy. My, my mentality. I remember once time, um, and what I mean by that is like, I remember one time. This is before all of that. I did, you know, when I did metrosexuality, um, it was reviewed by someone, and the reviewer said, I don't remember who it was, but the reviewer said, this show's so terrible. I hope it's the soundtrack is played at the funeral of everyone involved. I'm like, man, that fucking hurt me. <laughs> man, it hurt me. Like, but I'm, That's heavy. I'm from, where I'm from is like, where I'm from is like, you hold those, you hold that and like, bro, what? Do you know what I mean? The funeral? Nah, mate. Like, you know what I mean? So, I held that. I held that. And then years later, the reviewer died. I'm talking like 15 years later. Maybe more. The reviewer died, right? And I'm walking down the street and I say, oh, so-and-so reviewer's died and they've got a picture of him in the thing. And I stopped and I said, who's fucking funeral? And then I went, why did you do that? No different from him. And I realised I held that for 15 years. Mm -hmm. like, why did I do that? Do you think that was your main driving force though? Rage? something internally yeah. where the Hulk thing I said to you like I was always like every time I every time someone whispered oh he's not doing that or I'd go to an audition and they know about me they know about you before you go to the audition but they look at your CV and they go well you haven't done any theatre darling where's your training and you're like I haven't trained and they just sneer at you and they okay well let's go then yeah, and you just think you've mugged me off right at the beginning I'm a young actor You've mugged me off right at the beginning of this audition, treated me like shit. You know I've not done theatre because you would be told that by my agent, but you've just embarrassed me intentionally. I would sit there and I'd go, you're going to fucking work for me. That was my mentality. And maybe they wouldn't, but my mentality was like, if that's how you're going to treat me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to get to the top. When they told me, they said to me, you will never, you, 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 well, darling, you haven't done theatre, you haven't trained. I remember calling my agent at the time. I said, 
all I keep hearing is you've not done theatre, you're not going to get anywhere because, you know, you, you, you can't act and this, that and the other. I said, well, I, I want to do theatre. And she was like, well, darling, you know, we can, we can try and get you in some plays and blah, blah, blah. So I did a few little plays that no one really knew about. And then I did an Oval House play. Then I got a play in the Royal Court and then won a Laurence Olivier Award. Now, if you know about theatre, you know, the Laurence Olivier Award in England is, is the award. You told me I wouldn't, you told me I wouldn't get into theatre. What now? That's, that was my mentality. So I was always driven by people telling me I can't do things. It's the same thing as, as, as my, as my dad and, you know, people saying I'm, I'm, I'm difficult. I'm, difficult's not a crime, man. Like I'm, I, let me give you an example of me being difficult. And I'm jumping a little bit, so we'll go back. But I'll give you an example of me being difficult. Um, I did this job years later, years into it, where my 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 third my third child had, had been born. I get this job for ITV, um, and they um, not them, but the producers. Sorry, the producers go. Are there any days he's not available for the shoot? And I'm like, there's one day in 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 four months' time. It's the only one day. Every other day is cool. And they go cool, and shoot block one of this show. And I said, why is he not available? Oh, it's his son's christening. Shoot block one of this show. Everything's fine, blah, blah, blah. Have a week off, come back for block two. I look at block two on the schedule. They got me working on the day that I've asked for. That happens. Call my agent, I said, oh man, they got me working on the day, you know, it's my son's christening. So, um, you know, if I could get that off. Yeah, I'll speak to them. Just calls them, said, no, they've, they've scheduled it now. So it's going to be very tricky. They can't, I don't think they can actually do it. I said, mate, it's my son's christening. It's not a birthday. It's my son's christening. I need the day off. I'll call them again. Agent calls them again, comes back. No, they, it's a big location. They've scheduled it. They, they're, actually very, they're very apologetic, but they can't give you I said, all right, cool. Put down the phone. I walk, I walk out my trailer into the production thing. The guy's on the phone. Yeah, I said, yo, put the phone down. And he's like, I beg your pardon? I said, put the phone down. So I'll call you back, puts the phone down. I said, mate, this day here, it's my son's christening. I, I told you that from the beginning of the job. Yeah, yeah you, you know, no, it's, um, it's well, it's, you know, we booked the, 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 the thing now and I said, listen, you can film whatever you want on that day. I'm going to be at my son's christening. I'm just letting you know that. So if you want to bring the cameras and film me there, you can do that, but I'm not going to be here. All right? And I walk out. Now, I look back and I can imagine when I walked out there, like, you know, this guy's so difficult. But I didn't think I was being difficult. I just thought I was standing up for what I believed in. That's just who I am. Do you know what I mean? That's, I was just, I'm defiant. And actually, if I believe in something, I, I, I stand up for it. Right? When I grew up, my dad missed everything. Everything. He never come to a sports day. He never come to a parents evening. He never come to, he, he couldn't name any of my girlfriend. He missed everything. So I miss nothing with my children. Do you know what I mean? I can see how that would be difficult for people. But that's just who I am. Yeah, fuck everybody else as well. You've got to look after I know, but that's, that's like, but what happens is, what happens is you get a reputation of being difficult. I'm not a different, I'm not, I'm not a difficult guy. Do you know, or, or I can be, but it's, it's, it's these sorts of situations. I'm not like, there's no producer that can actually go on record and go, he was an, he was a problem on set. They can't. They just can't. But with your mindset, you're probably looking for perfection all the time to prove the doubters wrong, the haters. That's something that's fueling you. It's fueling me. Trying to get things right. Hundred so percent. It happens, man. Like people are difficult in life. I'm difficult sometimes. We're all difficult. My hundred percent. Fucking pissed and difficult. Like. But when people want to isolate you and persecute you for it, they'll they'll find they'll find whatever reasons to do that. And then you know that's kind of what we'll get to, I guess. But you know that's just who I am. So adulthood was next. Yeah. So. Did you write that? Write, yeah, wrote, produce, direct, wrote act. adulthood, wrote adulthood, and look, because your stock must have been high then after kid no. after Doctor Who, no. or you're still trying to prove that you were. You... Uh, mate, this is again after kid and adulthood. I, I'm sorry, after kid and Doctor Who, I got fuck all. I did barely anything. After kid up, nobody gave me new films. I wrote a bunch of scripts. Nobody was interested in any of them. I was just sitting there baffled. Like I, I saw other directors put films out and literally fall up the stairs. Like their film made three pound in the box office and then the next everyone's like, and then the next one's five million pounds. And I'm like, I don't understand this, but you know what? I was like, fine, we'll just crack on, just get on with it. I just go, all right, again. And it fueled me. I'm like, cool, 
All right, this is this how it's going to be? Cool. We're just going to crack on. So I wrote adulthood. And this was where, and again, this is another example of being difficult, right? This is where I started my company because I realized that, um, so the director didn't want to direct it. And then someone suggested to me, why don't you direct it? And I've never directed a movie in my life, but I'm like, I realized, same like you, you pay for half your lifeguard and of course they'll pay for the other half. I realized that if I didn't direct it, the film wasn't going to happen. So when they said, do you want to do it? I'm like, yeah, I'll do it. And they're like, well, you got to do a test shoot. So I did the test shoot. I passed the test shoot. All right. What's that test shoot? It's like they, back in the days, if they were going to, the new director, they would say, well, he's never directed before. Can you do like a 10 minute? A pilot? A, yeah. Like some scenes from the film in sequence to show that you can, you know, so you cast it, you do all of that kind of stuff and then you shoot this and you edit it. You do go through the whole process of making a film, but like on a mini version and then you submit it to them. And if they think you can direct, they approve the film. So I did all that, I passed the test shoot. We got adulthood, adulthood screen there. The producer at the time's like, this is not going to be successful like the first film. So I, I'm not, I'm not really, if, if they don't want to do it, if they're not financing it, I'm not interested in helping you. I'm like, all right, cool. Go to the meeting. They're like, we want to finance it. He's like, oh, okay. What happened was I started my company and I said, oh, can, can my company get credit on the movie? Because, you know, I've seen all you guys have got companies and I want to build my brand and just have a company. And they were all like, no. I said, what do you mean? Like, you guys have made money off me in the first film. I've made almost fuck all, but I understand I've got a film. We've got a second film, which I'm writing, starring and directing. I, I'd love my company to be credited. They were like, no. So I said, cool, I ain't doing it then. And they're like, of course you're doing it. You're, you're, given, you're being given an opportunity to direct a movie. Of course you're doing it. I said, you know where I'm from, bro? I come from nothing, mate. I ain't doing it. You going to credit my company or I'm not doing it? I pop ball the dash. Of course you're doing it. Closer to the movie, closer to the movie. As he signed the paperwork, I'm not signing, I'm not doing it. You're going to credit my company or I'm not doing it. You're going to give up the chance. to. I said, watch me. They credited my company. So on the back end, on the back of the film, in association with Unstoppable Entertainment, but it's like, you have to know your worth. You have to know your worth. And going back to being a kid, you have to not afraid to be alone, not be afraid to be alone. And I'm like, you're taking a piss out of me. Now, I've, I've realized now, I'm starting to realize, again, not academically smart, but socially smart, I realize it's taking the piss out of me. So you are going to credit my company and they did. Is that the more you're in the industry, you realize how snake it is. You look at yeah. boxers, you look at musicians, they hardly make any money. Yeah. It's the back end to take an older yeah. road. Did you start to realize? I started to that? realize that, yeah. Start more in company, but they're willing to maybe fund your film, but they're not willing to give you that extra leg up. Not, ever, not willing to give you the extra leg up. And this continued and we'll get to that. It's continued, but not willing to give you that extra leg up. So I, I basically, you know, I was like, I ain't doing it. But the thing is, is like, I guess, they didn't know who they were dealing with because most people understood the business in a way that they knew directing a film at 20 something finance with you starring was just unheard of. So most people would have like creamed their pat like no one would have done what I did. But I'm from the council estate, man. Like my friends have done mad shit. Like I don't, you can't, you can't hold that over me because I didn't, well, I didn't understand the business in that way. But also going back to my, my I didn't care. I'm like, I don't care. Because people always say to me, did you, the pressure of directing and starring all that, were you, were you frightened? What? I was like, no. Nah. I was not even phased. And that's probably, because, like now, now, even if someone said, right now you've got a new film now directed, I, I understand the business. I'd be like, fucking oh, up. All right, Clarky, come on, let's go. But back then, I wasn't even phased, mate. They're like, but you're going to start? And I said, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you think, you yeah, yeah, yeah. Wasn't even phased, man. How was Danny Dyer to work with? He's cool. He's great. He's great. I, I wrote him a letter back in them, them days. I said, look, mate, I'm a boy from West London. You're a boy from East London. You know, I think the audiences are similar in that way. I'd love you to come do a little bit in this film. He said, yeah, mate, I'll come down. He came down, did his day. And I think two day I went, came down, did his day, went home. He's great. He smashed it as well. He did. The same, the business, like football factor. Yeah, they've done good stuff. Same as adulthood and that. They were just in things that people can relate to. Relate to, yeah. 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 So then, 
how was the career then after that? Like again, was there still doors getting closed? Or were you thinking I need to keep pushing forward? Well, loads of doors were getting getting closed, and then and then um, all the f the films always got ignored all the time with everything. But then I got nominated for the Rising Star, which was the first BAFTA, which was two thousand nine. Yeah, voted for by the public. Voted for by the public, and that was um, and I won that. But it's voted for by the public. And and people have used that to discredit it for now it's just fine. But back in them days, I remember people going, Yeah, but it's very it's very full by the public. Every time every time I've achieved something in my career, people have used a reason to discredit it or 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 ruin it or every every, every time. Every Why? time. Because they don't have it. You know, I wanna I wanna just shout racism, but it's not always it's not always that. So yeah, the, because you've still won those awards, yeah. you've still been in blockbuster films, you've still died. Exactly. Like, so it's not always that. The doors. Sometimes it's just it's just yeah. like when you're achieving things that not only when you're achieving things that not only people haven't achieved, but what they want, hmm. they project in a way that, well, if they won it, it'd be the best thing in the world. When you win it, it's like, well, it's voted for by the public. Who cares? It's not a proper one. He'll never get a proper one. But if it was a public who voted for you, it clearly shows how well you were liked, liked and respected by the but public the, in your by mind, the public yeah so in your mind do sometimes you only maybe look at the negatives because you know that's the fuel that you need to keep kicking yeah, on yeah I think or I, do you ever concentrate on the positive and think <clears throat> wait a minute the public have voted for me here I'm clearly doing well or did you always think about I need to prove these fuckers wrong yeah <laughs> the second one <laughs> the second yeah. one I mean I, I you know, that's what's got you as far as it has. It's driven me, yeah. Because some people can take a bit of credit, won a little award. And sit down and relax. And they've made it. Yeah, never. Yeah. I never was like that. And and I used to, I used to, I used to see that. I used to say that. I used to see actors that would do things, get jobs, and just kind of, you know, you see their interviews and they sit back and they go, well, you know, I've, you know, I've, you know, blah, 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 blah. And I'd just be like, yeah, you sit in that chair, man. No, you sit in that chair. I ain't, <laughs> I ain't, I ain't sitting. I'm, I'm not sitting down for nothing. And I used to just graft, man. I would put pictures of our actors on the wall um, as targets. And I don't mean like in a bad way. Not people I disliked, people I liked. But like, man, that guy, that guy is doing amazing things. I want them, I want those roles. Mm -hmm. And I would bust my ass, man. Like I would like smash auditions. I would train. I would, you know, just watch every film and I'm one of those guys and she might be a spectrum thing. If I bought a DVD, if me and my mate bought a DVD and he went home and I went home and watched it, two hours later he'd be coming up, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm still watching the film. He'd be like, why? I'm like, there's four commentaries. I have to watch them all. I'm watching director's commentary, writer's commentary, producer. I'm watching everything. Composer's commentary. I want to know everything about why they made the choices they made and the school, like everything. He's like, I've just watched the movie, right? So I put pictures of paper on walls and I'm like, <clears throat> I'm going to bust my ass. I'm going to do everything, watch everything, read everything, learn everything until I go to an audition and I see him. Because when I go to an audition and I see him, or I see that his name was on the same list as me, I know that I'm climbing. Mm. And I used to do that all the time. Boom, that's the next person. And then I would, I would, I would do it until I saw him. I'd be like, how you doing? Nice to meet you and all that kind of stuff. And it's genuine. I didn't, I don't dislike anyone, right? Law of attraction. Yeah, I'm genuine. And I'd see him. And after that, after I met him once or I saw their name or whatever, I'd go home, take that down. I don't want to see you again. I'm passing you. I'm passing you by. I don't want to see you again. Mm. And people always see that as that. It's not arrogance. It's like belief. You manifest. I manifested this. Do you know what I mean? The success that I built, the career that I built, right? Through all the obstacles. And there's stuff we ain't even got time to tell you about. Like through all the obstacles, the career that I built, because I manifested it. Because every time I did something, I believed it. And when you sound like me and you're from where I'm from and you look like me and you have the confidence I have, people will label that narrative as do. And you and and you are successful enough or you work hard enough to be able to say no to people, the narrative that they will put out is that you're difficult or you're, you're angry because you, you're you not doing what they want you to do. I think to be at the top of the game though, you've kind of got to be psychotic. You've kind of got to be obsessed in your craft. I'm obsessed with this shit. Like, I do I'm saying. I don't care about any cunt else. No. I've got an agenda. My agenda is to be the best, be the biggest, feed my saying. kids and, and not fuck 100%. anybody along the way. Like, I, I'm a strong character. Where 100%. My name is very strong out there and people know the girl. 100%. But I've got to be obsessed. I've not got time to stand in fucking 
restaurants or do this or meet friends. I ain't got time. I'm too busy. 100%. 100%. I don't get... I, here's the thing, right? Everyone thinks that... A lot of people think they know me and obviously they know what they've heard about me. I don't give a, f I don't give a fuck who likes me, man. Like, I, I, honestly, I'm not, I've never been here to make friends. I've been here to... to you got something by your eye there, mate. Cool. I've been here to... I've been here to, gr to graft, right? And for me, all I've done... Like, I've never touched a drug. I don't drink. I mean, I'll have a bit of champs at Christmas and, you know, a bit of a port at Christmas, a bit of champs when the kids are born. I don't drink, never touch the drugs. I don't, I don't not even smoke weed. I don't, I don't part, I don't go out. So all these things that people are, oh, he was out there doing it. I never went out. I didn't party. I don't party. People never saw me. People didn't know me. People didn't know me. I would go work, come home, go work, come home. That's all I did. I busted my ass for 20 years. Do you know what I mean? And I didn't care. I didn't care what people thought about me, you know. And I think some, you know, I think where where there's a where there's a flaw, you know, if I can hold my hands up as a flaw, is sometimes when you stop caring about what people think about you, sometimes you stop caring about what they feel about you. And actually, you have to concern about how you make people feel, you know. You have to. So you know, maybe maybe there's times where oh well, I might have left someone feeling a bit of a way, not intentionally, but you know what I mean. I'm just trying to do what you said, feed my kids and, and bust my ass, you know. What was your mum thinking then? You've won a BAFTA, your household name. Like, she must have been proud. Did you ever feel that? Or were you too caught up and moving to the next level? This is an interesting one because I think that... I think my numbness comes from there. Because she must have been proud, but I can never say that we ever celebrated it. Do you know what I mean? So I think that's that's come from, but but I understand it. My mum's had a had a hard life. You know, I know we're gonna get into shit later, but when you talk about victims. My mum's a victim. People never tell me about victims. My mum's a victim of some shit, some real shit. Do you know what I mean? And I think that has made her a very guarded person. Do you see a lot of yourself in your mum? Yeah. Yeah. That that those barriers that 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 guardedness, like, you know, I've seen some shit, bro. Like I ain't a gangster. I've seen some, some shit, and my mum saw some some shit, and that shapes you. And I didn't have guidance. Nobody took that kid, whose friends were getting shot and stabbed and going to jail and all. Nobody guided me when I got into the business. There wasn't someone who went, "Welcome here. Let me show you how to, to play the game." Well, firstly, I wasn't interested in playing no game. It's like I'm coming here to win. I'm here to win. But secondly, it was like, I didn't know what to do. So when they're like, "Oh, he spoke to people wrong," I spoke how I speak. That's how I spoke my whole life. Like you don't. You know, there's no intent. There's no intent. I'm not a malicious person. There's no intent there to, to harm or, or speak wrong to people or whatever like that. I'm just standing up for what I believe in or or who I am or my beliefs. Like I said, like, go to work, go to your son's christening. That's a no brainer to me. That's not even a question. To me, it's yeah. not even a question. Family over anything. Family over everything. But I know, I know actors that miss everything. Oh yeah, well, son's Christian. Well, I'll, I'll have another kid. I'll go to work. Fuck that, man. Uh, Fuck that. There's a lot of sacrifice in that. Is a lot, then. mate. I, I've met. Or else you just get fucked off and lose a job. Right, but you know what? Again, I didn't care. Like, and I did sacrifice. There's been times I've been away from my kids for months, but I don't miss birthdays. I remember telling one production like, "You got to fly me home for my kid's birthday." They're like, "Are you serious?" I'm like, "Yeah, it's my kid's birthday." So I'm telling you at the beginning of the job, like I've told you, it's not like, I'm a producer as well. I know how these things work. You can schedule it. I want to go home for my son's birthday. I don't care if it's for 12 hours. Oh, so difficult. What's he like to work with? Oh, it's difficult. Made us fly, boom. Flies around. Oh, someone said he's difficult. Someone said, I'm not, I'm not difficult, mate. I'm, I'm simple. Like we start work at nine o'clock. Brotherhood came out then. Yeah. Next, like <clears throat> again, every film seemed to have got better. Yeah, that was your biggest grossed one, eh? Yeah, it was. Yeah, like, that smashed it the opening mm -hmm. week. Didn't know it. Mm -hmm. um, Stormzy in it as well, big yeah. man. Like what again? Big right, produced, 
all the same stuff produced with that. by that point yeah mm. produced by that point so yeah. what you thinking then once you another blockbuster that was a smash hit like that genuinely did smash every fucking record that like, how were you treated then once that came out well was that must have been a different that must have been a game changer no well that was different gravy because because i kind of kind of almost gone into the wilderness because after adulthood succeeded I, I did you know 4321 which did really well and i tried to do we did fast girls which i wrote or didn't produce or anything but then i tried to do other films i wanted to show people that were from where i'm from that we could do stuff like fight aliens and all this kind of stuff so i tried to do other films to, to really broaden people's minds and they weren't ready for them maybe the films weren't great but the point is they just didn't work they just didn't work so i had to accept that i'm like okay well that didn't work that didn't work that didn't work and then I found myself like from going to, I found myself from being able to finance a film, right? That was a confidence I had because like we could find, a film could be financed off of me. You could sell a studio, I'll be in it. And they go, he's, you're in it, right? Two million pound. And then I could go to other actors and I didn't need them. I didn't need them. So then I could do better deals because I didn't actually need them. I'd be like, I don't need you. The film's going to shoot. So I've got this money if you want to do it or not. Right, boom. So we do better deals and all that. Then after those other films didn't work, that ceased to exist anymore. It was like, I want to do a film that I, 500 grand maybe for you in it, because these other ones had not done well. How did that, how did you handle that? The flops? Just learn from it. Yeah. There's no, there's no, for me, it's like you, you, you win or you learn, right? Because I, I'll be talking earlier, if I get big views and I don't get the same the next week, I think, oh, there's no bill of me anymore. Am I slipping? So I'm straight back on it. Yeah, yeah, Don't yeah. sleep straight back on it. I was definitely straight back on it all the time, but it was kind of like, it was learned, it was learning. I remember I did a film, Story 24, which, you know, one newspaper, weirdly, I think the same newspaper that done this to me, um, made sure to point out that was the lowest grossing film in America in 2000, I think. Like, they didn't go, Council of State Boy has film released in the US and, and distributor only puts it on the screen, one screen to unlock TV money. They didn't say that, that's not a sexy headline. So they had to blast me and say it was the lowest gross in film, right? But I learned from that. I remember going into the, the office of this company and they were like, look, the film hasn't done well here, whatever, but we've got all the international posters. What people don't know is the film didn't do well here, but it sold everywhere around the world, everywhere. And I just always took these things as learning experiences and they showed me the posters, international posters. And on all the international posters, like China, this place, that place, da, da, da. I wasn't on most of them. And I said, oh, what's happening here? And they were like, oh, well, 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 I said, no, no, I'm not. I said, I'm not fussed. I said, T -t explain to me. And they were like, look, in some countries, having your face on the thing doesn't benefit the film. I was like, oh, so like, for example, in Asia, putting me there is not going to relate to them. Whereas if you put all the, the white people up front and the Asian people, they're going to relate to that more. They were like, yeah, it's got it. I didn't get offended by that stuff. It's a learning experience. So then I was like, I know how to, now I know how to market to Finland. Now I know how to market to Turkey. Now I know how to market to Asia. I'm learning about where the audiences are and what they want. Do you know what I mean? So the flops were not, because of how I was, I wasn't gutted by them, but I was kind of like, okay, we need to regroup. But they weren't, they weren't without their learning experience. Do you know what I mean? You learn, the growth as well. what they, you learn from everything. Yeah. You know? So Brotherhood out then, what are you thinking? So Brotherhood, when Brotherhood came out, right? So the first thing I'm told again is, all right, we're going to do this film, but you have to be, you have to know it's not going to do as well as the last one. That's what the guys told me, right? And then one studio tries to shortchange us. They're just like, well, it's not going to do well. So we're going to give you this amount of money for all these territories around the world. And we're just like, come on, man. Like, it, this is, this is, this is brotherhood. Like, you know, no, no. And then another studio is like, what? They're mugging you off. We'll give you this just for the UK. We're like, cool, we'll go with you. Right. So we went with the other studio, which pissed off the first studio so much. They blocked all our other movies. This is how petty it was. They blocked all, we had two other movies in there that were about to get made and they just blocked them because they didn't get brotherhood. And I found out afterwards and I approached the exec. I said, why'd you do that? And he's like, well, I wanted Brotherhood and you didn't give it to me. I'm like, you shortboard us. And he's like, "Is what it is. And I was like... Admitted that? Yeah, he admitted it. Because I caught him at lunch. I walked into his thing at lunch and he's sitting there and I sat down. He was in the main thing at lunch. I said, you, 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 you blocked our movies, didn't you? 
And he's like, well, well, I said, no, 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 just, I said, just be honest. You blocked him, didn't you? He's like, yeah, I did. I did. Because I wanted brotherhood and you did. I said, but you tried to mug us off, man. He said, I, I worked with you for this amount of years. I was waiting for that film and then you gave it to me. I said, but you literally tried to rob me. Uh, so I was like, cool. So we go to this other studio, right? And then I don't hold the rights to the films because the people that produced them at the beginning, the same one that said he weren't interested at the beginning of, of, of adulthood, right? He owns the rights. Cause when you, when you, when you're producing stuff, you, you take the rights. So you didn't do anything wrong. But this guy like basically then held us to ransom. We had to give this guy 10% of the budget just for him to give us the rights to, to, to make brotherhood. This is stuff I created, but this is how these people treat me, right? 10% of the budget. So from a 1.2 million pound movie, you get 120, 120 grand. grand. In fact, I think, I think it, for, just having, for doing fuck all, for just having the rights, just because he don't like me, <laughs> simply because he doesn't like me. Right, so we, we do that. Um, so now you've got 1 million and 50, whatever you've got, right? Which, you know, to people that have never made a film before sounds like luxury and it is luxury. But, you know, if you make films and you, you by this point, I've done everything I've done, I should be getting much more money. Then I get told by the studio that is doing it, with all due respect to them, I, I, and I love the guy that was there. He was like, look, the last film was 2008. Since then, social media, Netflix, Amazon, all this stuff this film's not going to make as much money as the last ones. You have to understand that. I'm like, cool, all right, cool. In my mind, I'm like, it's going to make more. I know it is, because I, I know what I'm writing and I know what the audience is going to be. And he's, you know, and it comes out and it makes more. He's, he's dancing a jig, like, couldn't believe it. And then people started going, oh, hold on a second. This guy's still, people still interested in this guy. And then things started to roll. Then Bulletproof started to roll. People started going, okay, well, we need to get him on TV because if he's bringing this money to cinemas and they're paying to see him, imagine if he's free. And then things started to roll. And that's when things started to really start taking off. It's mad though, like Brotherhood and that, like smash hits and smashing millions and millions of pounds opening week, like. And for such a low budget, like how far do you think you would have got if somebody says, look, there's 10 million, there's 20 million? Mate, there's a, there's firstly, a firstly, I think I would have, the type of person I was, like if, if somebody gave us 20 million, I would have probably made 10 movies. But why was nobody giving you the, the, the risk, or not even the risk, because the movies speak for themselves, the, the numbers speak for themselves, so why... There's nobody to take the the chance or say, look, this is what we've got here, bang, 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 bang. And then you would understood if they're taking a percentage for it, they're funding it, we get it. Well, well, why did, I don't need to answer that. We, we know the answer to that. I don't need to answer that. We know the answer to that. As I said, like there were directors that were doing films that made 300 grand, literally tripping at the bottom of the stairs and rolling up the stairs. Your film made 300 grand, next film's 5 million. That f 5 million pound film makes 2 million, next film's 30 million. How does that make sense? was I'm busting my ass and 10 years later, I'm still doing films for 1.2 million. I think like, we know the answer to that. So see, when, how was Storms that he worked with? He's great. He was great. He was still, he hadn't blown, he hadn't blown up yet. I mean, he was on the ground, underground. He was, he's the guy. And you know, my business partner at the time was like, yo, this is the guy. So we, I, we knew it as a mutual woman that we knew. And I, I, I just called her up and said, you know, I'd like, to talk to him about being in this film. And he, he said he's had offers before, but this film kind of makes sense. And then he came and he did it. He smashed it. He went on. Like, we're not, mm -hmm. I like the guy, but we're not mate. Like he doesn't come around my house or anything. We're like, we're not mates. You know what I mean? Then Bulletproof comes along. Yeah. Sky One. Yeah. That mega show as well. That mega. How did that come about? Bulletproof. So in 2009, 2000 and 2009, Ashley and I, uh, we're at, I don't know, we're, we're at, at an event. And I think um, we're walking around in the back and he, he sees me and he goes, uh, I don't know what happened. Anyway, we start speaking. He says, oh, we should work together because, you know, we, we both realized that 18, uh, nine years in the game or whatever like that. And like, we've kind of been, we feel kept apart, kept apart. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's like, why wouldn't, both of these guys are doing well. Why wouldn't you do a film with them together or something like that? So we're like, let's work together. So we start meeting up in this coffee shop and we go, right, what do you want to do? 
villains, police. And we're like, nah, we're villains, let's, let's be police officers. And he goes, all right, let's be, yeah, we'll be police officers. And he goes, oh, well, let's do it like one of us is, he says, I'm, I'm known as the bad boy, right? You know, actually well, at the time he's known as the bad boy. He says, so I'll be like the good one. He says, and you're kind of known as the goody, you know, so you be the bad one, like cool. So we plot this thing, six page, you know, I, I, I then go where I write this six page thing about what it should be and da 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 da. And then bust, bust our ass for years, bust our ass for years trying to get that set up. Um, various different incarnations of what we're trying to do, just, just nothing happens. And then eventually, you know, I just never give up. And then I have a meeting with Vertigo Films and they're just like, have you got any TV ideas? I give them that document and they're like, we love it. We love it. But again, this is where we go back to the company stuff. So give them that document and they go, we love it. And they take it to Sky and Sky go, we love it. We want to do this thing. And I mean, actually like, cool. And then they're like, we want to bring on Nick Love. I'm like, why? Well, because Nick Love and da 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 da. I'm like, yeah, oh, cool. I love, I don't love him. I, I know Nick Love, I respect him, but why do you need to bring some of those sons? Well, we just think like the three of you, da 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 da. So me and Ashley, all right, what do you think? Oh, cool, bring Nick Love on. Nick Love adds his flavor to it, makes it better. Can't, can't knock it, makes it better, you know, give, gives it another energy, whatever. Then Vertigo go, you, you guys' companies can't have any credits. So I'm in the same position. And I don't dislike this company. I don't dislike Vertigo, but I'm just telling you facts of what happened. Why not? Well, because, you know, we're, we're the ones, the exposure taking it to Sky and blah, blah, blah. So me and Ashley have a chat. We're like, should we be stubborn or should we get the film made? I get the, the show made. All right, let's get the show made. All right, cool. Go there. We're adding Nick as creator as well. Why? You brought him on. Yeah, because he's added so much flavor into it and blah, 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 blah. And that's fair, isn't it? And, it, you know, kind of, we're all creating this new show together off your document. So, okay, cool. So I'm good with all this, but in the back of my mind, I'm like, so then, you know, Sky made the show and it's Vertigo Films and um, whatever else. And it comes out and, you know, it was fire. But what people don't know is, a lot of the stuff in there, like the fist bumps and the trainers and the, and the, uh, and the, uh, this is all stuff we, we added. Like it, it wasn't in the drafts. Like, you know, I, I knew Ashley and I knew the sort of show that we wanted to make and we got there in terms of the scripts, but in terms of the energy and the, 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 the sort of the lightness, anyone who knows my films and knows my humor knows that's, that's me. Do you know what I mean? Like, and I would get every, every morning get into the trailer. Ash, what are you saying? Yeah, man, come, boom. All right, this is what we're going to do. And he's like, yeah, why don't we do this? I'm like, yeah, why don't we do that? And we would, you know, the script supervisor was like, the script supervisor is the person that makes sure you say your lines correctly and all this kind of stuff. They were just like, because we just didn't, we just did our own thing. Like, we just, we would basically change the scenes every every morning and go, let's do this. And we do the fist bump here. And I talk about our trainers here. And we talk about being scared of the driver in there, da, da, da. And we did all that kind of stuff. And the, the show come out and smash, just absolutely smashed it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely smashed it. So how was that from 10 years ago? You're fighting for the same rights to have your your business put on. It was annoying. And then 10 years later, your stocks get bigger, everything's bigger. It's a case of, look, we're giving you the opportunity, accept it or just fuck off, we'll bring somebody else in. If you don't accept it, then well, they could, on you're a pest. Yeah, well, again, you, you get called difficult, right? But we just kind of thought we'll accept it. But this is where it gets interesting. So the show comes out, absolutely smashes it. Like it's the number one show on Sky. Great show. You man. know, blah, 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 blah. So then season two gets announced immediately, right? After season one, season two gets announced. Um, everyone's talking about it. They come to us and, you know, uh, they're like, right, season two. So boys should sign off for season two, this, that, and the other. I was like, I'm not doing it. What? Said, I'm not doing it. I need my company credit. You just had a hit show. Are you ridiculous? You just had a hit show. Blah, blah, blah. What do you mean you're not doing it? I said, I'm not doing it. Ashley's calling me up. No, what, what, are, you, what are you doing, man? Like, blah, blah, blah. I said, bro, like, hiring us does not build us. Do you know what I mean? Like, just hiring people does not be. 
What's it? What's the thing? Give a man a fish, he can fish for a day, right? Or some, I don't know. Yeah. Teach him how to fish. Just hiring me doesn't do it. I'm not, I want my company credit. I'm not having it. I spoke to Ash and he was like, well, you know what, bro? You've been busting your ass like more than me. So like, if they can only credit one company, you've been busting your ass more than me. If they can only credit company, like, well, let's go with yours, whatever like that. You've actually got the infrastructure now. Cause by this point I'd had my deal. I'd had my big company deal, which we can talk about. Um, and I said, I said, ultimately bro, like between you and I, I'm going to do it, but I ain't doing it right now. Like, so we just, I just, I went with that and I stood my ground. Because again, it comes back to like, you don't know where I'm from, mate. Like, I'm not having it. And they credit, and my company got credited. I didn't get money for it though. Like people need to know, we weren't cut into the production fee. So the production fee, you do a big TV show or a film or whatever, 10% of the fee goes towards a production company that makes it for like all their work and all that kind of stuff. So we were cut out of that. We didn't get any of that. I think we got, I got like a little bonus on season two, but we didn't get any of that stuff. So, so people perception is that we're basking in this, we're rolling in it. Like we're still getting mugged off even, even all these years later. But, no, but I love this company. Like the, the, the main guy there is, he's this person I love and respect massively, but people just need to know, like me and Ashley weren't just like raking it in. Do you know what I'm saying? And so, but I had to stand my ground. So the company was credited and that was, that was the start. What you paid for just the acting then? Acting and a bit of exec producing, and obviously I wrote I wrote them as well. But the effort that you have put into it, man, like it's only right. Like I know, but this, your crust, this it? is this is the business, and also people. What people don't know, what people don't know, they don't know. Do you know what yeah. I mean? And I don't begrudge Nick. Like we didn't begrudge Nick. Nick came on, he added his flavour. They wanted to give him a coke for it. I'm fine. We didn't argue that. You know, but but again, it, it, this is the sort of narrative that is where people go, oh, it's difficult, you know? I remember they wanted to bring on a casting director. And this casting director is someone that has known me for probably 20 years, never given me a sniff of nothing. Was so, so friendly with me when I first started out. He's even got one of the original bats from Kid Oldwood. Never given me a sniff of nothing. All I've heard is this guy through, through the grapevine talking bad about me, but. I've never said any word. And then they told me they're bringing this casting director on. I said, no way. But I'm the difficult one. I said, no way. They said, well, come and have a meeting with him. So I sat down with him and we met and we spoke. And he's like, you know, but, you know, I've respected you. You've always been busy. I said, you ain't giving me nothing for 20 years. Why should you eat off my, off my plate? But they call me difficult. What do you say? He said, nah, but you know, I, you know, but I do respect you. And I said, nah, mate, you ain't, you ain't eating off my plate. It's not happening. So we can have this meeting, but I've known you 20 years and you don't owe me anything. Like no one owes you anything. Like nobody owes you anything. But you know, when people have done things that you know you're right for and they've not even seen you, not even had a chance to audition. So I said, no. Nah. So bulletproof and then viewpoint as well. Viewpoint. <sighs> best performance I've ever done mate Viewpoint was the best performance I've ever done it was like a chance to be different a chance to be what people didn't expect it's a very you know I'm naturally very animated wow. naturally very animated and, 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 and bulletproof's very sort of you know but Viewpoint was very still and very sort of um He thought a lot of thought into with the character and stuff like that. And I was immensely proud of that. Immensely proud of that. Do you feel as if you were coming to the, the, the pinnacle of your career, the top, where you 100%. felt as if everything was making sense? 100%. You came I just, the brotherhood. 100%. But like, like, you're just putting all the pieces together. And that just you feel, not untouchable, but you feel as if it was making sense. Definitely not untouchable, but I just got good. I've been doing it for years off of natural, off of raw, off of like learning. People see me grow up in the business, just learning. I just got good. I just got good. It just clicked for me. Everything had just clicked for me. And I don't mean the industry. I had just gone, okay, I understand this now. I understand performance. I understand, I understand the way you need to, the nuances. 
I just, I understand, I can play this character, I can play that character, I can be angry, I can be sad, I just got, I understand, I understood the business in a way that most people don't. Because of my experiences and, and the roadblocks and the way I had to navigate, I understood producing, I understood directing, I understood writing, I understood acting, I understood, I had a company, I understood the business in a rounded way, I understood audience. Like no matter what people say, you know, you know, there's lots of people go, oh, you can't act, you can't. No matter what people say, the facts are the facts, mate. Like the achievements of the films, doing theatre, winning this, doing that, winning that, doing this, winning that. The achievements are the achievement, the facts are the facts. And it's not all, it's not all, it's not all, it's not all talent. Because I'm not the most talented at anything. It's our understanding, starting to learn the business. Bulletproof doesn't just work because it's the best show. It's not the best show. So I understand the audience. I know who is I know who was targeted at. Kirotwood, adulthood and brotherhood, more the latter two, because the first one was just what it was. It's not just about hood rats are watching them or or they got lucky. It's like I know the audience. I know audiences. We did a show for Channel 5 called The Drowning. I wasn't in it. Not 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 around it. Biggest show on Channel 5 in 10 years. Not because it's the best show. It's because when we developed it, we understood the Channel 5 audience. And so it was almost like, you know, you know, it was almost like Neo in the Matrix. I stopped seeing people and I started seeing the, the numbers. I could see the code. That chess game. I could see, I could see everything. Mm -hmm. And I was just getting to that point and then boom. So then you won the BAFTA for, what was it, Lifetime? What was that yeah, achievement? Outstanding contribution to British cinema, yeah. Because you were in the industry for nearly twenty years, everything yeah. you achieved, writing, directing, producing, yeah. acting, yeah, like every every fucking box you could tick. Like, yeah. You've won that BAFTA. You've come off of Brotherhood. You've come off of Bulletproof, Bulletproof. and then you're you're thinking, I'm at the top of my game. You like you say, you're seeing the patterns. Yeah. You understand it now. You understand yeah. how the game works. Yeah. You've got your credibility. Everything you've worked for has came. Yeah. You've got the BAFTA, but everything's all gravy. The same time, the same month you get the BAFTA, bang, allegations seep in and then the dark clouds come over that. Did you know what was going to be happening with the Guardian and everything before that? How does it, what Yeah, happened? so, so the first thing that happened is, um, I was, uh, I was, um, I was like, oh man, they, they call you because they call you like a week before they announce it and they go, listen, we want to award you this. What do you think? Fucking hell, man. I'm like, wow. And you know, after everything I've told you, it was the first time I felt they've accepted me. I was like, they've accepted me. And they ask you, did you want to accept it? And I was like, I said, let me take a couple of days, right? Because you're just like, you know, it's the first time I was like, I think they finally, I think they finally, 20 years in, accepted me and gone like, do you know what? This guy busted his ass. We've accepted him. And then they announce it on 29th of March. And the, the, the response is just, they announce it on the 29th of March and the response is just like overwhelmingly positive. And I'm just thinking, wow, you know, and my default setting as always is like, whatever, move on. But I can't help but go, crack a smile for the first time like wow you know because people see pictures of me I never used to smile I'm always like because that was just I crack a smile I'm like wow and then that was a Friday I think and then a Monday morning I'm on set and I get this phone call and my agent goes yeah hi I've got the um, PR on the line as well so if, you, if your agent calls you and goes I've got the PR on the line as well straight away my, I'm like what's happened and he's like yeah, yeah hold on a second I'm like fuck what's happened Goes, we've had anonymous emails coming. I said, yeah, what are they saying? Anonymous emails coming saying you're an assaulter and you're this, that, and the other, and you should not be getting this award. I'm like, what the f what were you talking about? And I kind of was like, what were you on about? I said, what have you ever, and, and bear in mind, right? I've worked 20 years. And in those 20 years, right? Not one of my agents has ever had a complaint. But it's not me fibbing or we've had to brush things under the carpet. None of my agents have ever had a complaint. None of them. None of my PR teams have ever had to kill a story. 
right? I've been around PR women my whole life. I've seen them kill stories for, for actors and directors and I've seen it happen. Like I've never done any of that. I've never had any of that, right? So I'm just like baffled, right? Um, I'm just, I can't, I can't believe it. But I'm like, well, there's a few, I'm a few, few people I think, well, that's probably so-and-so, whatever, because I've had, I've had trouble in the past and we'll get to that. Um, uh, not this sort of trouble, but people. Um, and they said, and they've sent this email to BAFTA as well. I'm like, fucking hell. I said, what do we do? I said, well, we're just going to keep monitoring it and blah, blah, blah. Next day, more emails from the same account. And it's this, 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 this have you heard of Proton emails? No. Oh. Fucking, <laughs> neither had I. Neither had I, right? So Proton emails are these, this, I think they're Swiss. And they basically ensure privacy. So this Swiss company, they don't give out any information about anyone. Right? Swiss, right? So, you know, they're neutral. They don't give out any, you have to, you have to get police involved and all that kind of stuff. It takes a long time to get the information. I mean, you can get it, but it takes a long time. But generally, you can't get any information about, right? It's Proton. So these people are using Proton emails. So, you know, immediately the agents are like, well, we're looking into this. These emails keep flying in. The survivors of this guy, the, the victims of this guy, blah, 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 for 20 years. We're going to march. We're going to march on BAFTA with all the victims. There's, there's hundreds of us. Da, da, da. I've still got, I've still got a lot of these emails, screenshots of these emails where they're just talking all this stuff, this, that, and the other. And mate, my heart is just, cause I'm like, what? And this just keeps, it just keeps, keeps, keeps going. So 10 days later, so then BAFTA, BAFTA start communicating with, with these emails going, well, this is, this is terrible. We're like, tell us, tell us more, whatever like that, you know, give us some ideas. And these people are not telling them anything. They're just like, he's just done this. He's done this. We're going to march on your building, this, that, and all this kind of stuff. And you know, I, I can't, I can't knock them at this point, BAFTA, because they were engaging. They're trying to find out what's happening, so they're trying to. They're obviously trying to do, I guess, what they should do, and, and think, well, if this guy has done all these things, we need to to find out. So they keep asking, and eventually, these conduits come forward. These conduits of of that 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 know my survivors, and are, 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 are ensuring BAFTA that it's real. We're ensuring you that it's real. And it's his husband and wife and this other woman, like, and they're ensuring that, you know, bear in mind, I've never met this husband in my life. Never met him. Doesn't know me, right? The wife I've met and spent two years with her on the film committee. Not a, not a crossword. Not a, not, a, not, a, not a bad look, not a crossword. Hello, mate, how are you? Boom, for two years, right? But they're involved. They're the conduits, right? And they're telling BAFTA, we're assuring you this stuff is real. So BAFTA's getting really shaky now. Right, they're stopping communicating with me. They're talking to my agents and all this kind of stuff. It's getting, it's getting a little bit like, what is going on? Um, and then this just keeps building up. And then I start seeing my harasser, my convicted harasser, the guy that's been harassing my family for ten years and putting out this narrative that I've been bullying him. Like, right? And I, I don't know why I've let this go for all this time, but I have done. And I probably shouldn't have, but I've just let it go because I was being like, whatever. But obviously that was a mistake. And this guy's been, I see him start tweeting laughing faces and, 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 and prison bars and saying things like nobody's unstoppable. So like, I know him, I know immediately, I know immediately that he's involved. I just know, right? And I, I don't care anyone can say, I, I know. Cause I, you know, you tweet this stuff or Instagram it and delete it. But what he doesn't know is since 2014, 15, when he was convicted of harassing me, I've had people screenshotting him. So anytime he puts something up, it gets screenshotted. And even if he deletes it, we've got it, right? There's a, there's a, there's a, the police have a 10 year file on him, which is still active right now. But, so he starts tweeting this stuff. So now I'm just kind of like, okay, well, that's happening there. This happening here, but I can't connect. I can't connect it all. I know that he knows about it, but I can't connect it all. And then friends start calling me. Women start calling me. Oh yeah. Um, someone's been trying to get information about you. I'm like, who is it? Like they, they, they wouldn't say, but you know, this, that, and the other, like, but I just so you know, I, I hope you're all right, et cetera, et cetera. I might make, my heart is literally like in my mouth. I just can't understand what's happening. And then, so I have to keep talking to these conduits and they keep saying to the conduits, give us a fact, give us one fact about what he's supposedly done and we will not give him this award. 
right? Which is well within their right to do that. And I think like, what else should you do? They're not given any facts, not given any facts. They're not told anything. The day before the award, all my employers, Sky, BBC, all free media, BAFTA, not an employer, but whatever. And my agents, they all got in a, all get on a Zoom, right? And they all be like, they're all of them, right? And this is facts, it can be checked. All of them go, we've never heard anything like this about him, ever. This is getting pretty serious, but we've never, none of us, have, none of us can say we've heard anything like this about him. We've heard he can be difficult. We've heard he's a bit tricky. We've never heard anything like this about him at all. So what do we do? So BAFTA, like, we have to, we have to give him the award. Because you can't just not, you know. So, you know, they did what they were supposed to do in my eyes. I'm not defending them because <clears throat> trust me, I, there's no love here for them for how they acted afterwards. But at this point, they did everything that they could possibly do to verify what is happening. On the 11th of April, I think it is, I'm told, well, you're getting the award, you've got to go there. This is supposed to be the best day of my career. It is like literally the second worst day of my life. They, and again, just like I said earlier, everything I achieved through my whole career, people have tried to discredit or ruin or spoil for whatever reasons. They don't like me because I'm arrogant or what, for whatever reasons. But so I go there on that day with a speech I've had written for years, by the way. Everyone's like, well, he only wrote that speech because he knew what was happening. I've had that speech written for years because since I won the first one, people have given me grief about how I boxed up. Do you know what I mean? So I was thought, if I ever win, a, if I ever win another one, I'll say, or I, I, I want to apologize, but actually I'm not apologizing. That's so I've had it written for years, right? I go up, I do my, mate, this is the worst. This is at, the, at this time, this is the worst day of my life, right? I'm on there, I'm walking through, I'm seeing people from BAFTA looking at me, side eyeing me, because I know some of them know that this is happening. It's just like the most horrible thing. I go there, do my speech, leave, I can't. You talk about never celebrating. I can't celebrate anything. I don't even touch that fucking thing. I just put it on the shelf. Like, do you know what I mean? I just, I can't even, I've not touched it since. Um, and get the award, get the award. The, the, everything's positive. Thing comes out. Everyone's really positive. After then don't air my speech on the, they don't put it on social media. So they're already, they're already in their mind. They've already in their mind decided what they're doing. Right, they can pretend whatever. They don't put my speech on social media. They don't um, promote it or anything like that. So they've already decided. Um, but nothing happens, right? The day after I win it, emails go everywhere to Sky, to all three, to everywhere. So the, the people were so whoever the people are. Well, I, I know who they. I know who it was, but they were so angry. They start sending the emails everywhere, targeted just to. And, and not to people, not like, oh, we're making the industry better to everyone, just to people I'm working with, just to the companies I'm working with, even the production companies, Vertigo, Tiger Aspect, like viewpoint people, just to targeted people that I'm working with. And then, then I start getting calls going, yo, the newspapers are calling me. And then a friend of mine calls me and she goes, this person's DMing me, this journalist DMing me. And she sends me the journalist, all the journalist contact details. And it's got her number, her email, and her email's like so-and-so Proton email. Proton email? Where have I seen that before? Now, I'm not saying that they sent them, but I just found I've never heard of this thing. And then all of a sudden, one of the journalists has it as well. Like, I don't... I don't know if they were advising them. I don't know if it was, I don't know if it was set up for, I, I don't know, but it just felt a little bit odd to me. You know what I mean? So at that point, this guy here now is tweeting more things and deleting them, tweeting more things and deleting them, but we're screenshotting everything, we're screenshotting everything. And then on the 26th of, 26th of April, I just get, a, I get an, a call. Hi, it's so-and-so from The Guardian. We were calling you. I just said, call my agent, put down the phone. I'm, I'm dying. I'm dying. Like, I, I, I don't know what a sense of dread or doom feels like, but it must have felt like that. Like, I'm just dying. Like, 
this thing comes over my body like like I'm just dying my ass is in my fucking my heart's in my ass like I'm dying I'm like, I just can't believe this and then I open this email that they send and I just see this thing man and I just see it and I'm just like what the fuck And they go, you've got 24 hours to respond. I don't have, I don't have a, I don't have a crisis PR. I don't have crisis lawyers. I've never had, I've never needed any of that stuff because I'm a, I'm a normal guy for sure. Like, am I imperfect, am I imperfect, flawed, normal guy for sure? But like, they're calling me abuser, assaulter. Then I'm reading this stuff and I'm seeing these names and I'm like, I've literally helped you for 10 years. I, I, I'm just, I can't even, you know what I mean? And then, you know, and I've spoken to a lot of journalists since and a lot of people, people think I've been sitting on my ass for two years. I've not, I've been speaking, I spoke to a lot of people. They're like, getting 24 hours to respond to this stuff is just not, it's not done. You know, people get, get a week, whatever, sometimes more because it's a lot to take in. They're like 24 hours. All the stuff I have now, all the information I have now, I couldn't have collected if I couldn't have collected in that time anyway. So everything that you've went through from the kid reading his comics to trying to stay out of trouble to then building a profile for 20 years, winning the BAFTA, you're thinking it's all great, getting the phone call from the Guardian, it wasn't just one accusation, it was 20. They were trying to paint you as a Harvey Weinstein character. Like, so you're thinking, and I, how can they release that without any charges, any convictions that... Like, how can they how can they release that against someone? I don't know, mate. That's the question, isn't it? So they give me twenty four hours. I suddenly have to get these lawyers that never met me before, right? So these lawyers have to respond to this. They don't know me, right? So these lawyers have to come in and they have to. They just have to. I just go, mate. That's not true. That's not true. That's not true. So they denied everything, which is which is the right thing to do. But I couldn't even provide context because I didn't have the time to get the things I needed. They're just like. And so these lawyers have never met me. So these lawyers, in all due respect to them, they, they're saying all this stuff, but they don't, they don't, they don't know. They can't put their firm in danger. They don't, they don't know. You know what I mean? And they're like, we're publishing it on Thursday. And they put it out. I picked the kids up from school. Pick the kids up from school. And we just went. I had some friends that were like, you got a place to go. We just went there. And they just put it out. Life upside down. Targeted as a monster. Just all your work f for what? For this. This is what they wanted. So exactly what they wanted just to destroy me. There's no, there's no, if, if you think somebody's done all that stuff, if you think somebody's done that stuff, you go to the police. If you think somebody's done all those things that they, that they made it to look like, because when you, when you actually read it, when you actually read it, oh, he said my bum was nice. He told me he likes to pull long hair. He propositioned me at dinner. I said, no, he went home. When you actually read it, he stores unsolicited, he takes and stores unsolicited pictures. How do you take unsolicited pictures? Am I hiding in changing rooms? Big actor like me, am I hiding in changing room towel, towel bins? And when they throw the towels in, I'm popping up. How do you take unsolicited pictures? How do you store unsolicited pictures? If people send me unsolicited pictures, why am I in trouble? Should they be in trouble? Do you know what I mean? Sharing? I don't share. I've never shared unsolicited pictures. Go find them. Go find the pictures I've shared. You ain't going to find any. Because that's what one of the women says you were videoing her at a sex scene or that she was naked right, right. and apparently so, you were so, sharing it around everyone. There's things I can't talk about right now, but let me tell you, I, what I can tell you is fact, right? Let me tell you about that, these, these supposed sneaky uh, naked auditions that we're having. Never happened, right? And what I mean by that is we had an audition. There was a film called Legacy, which there was a role which was a hippie. Hippie, it's like a hundred pound a day, no money, you know, and the, this hippie role had had moments of nudity in it, right? And and um 
This was organized by a proper female casting director. This wasn't sneaky. It wasn't getting people in and be like, oh, get your clothes off. It never, never happened. This was organized by a proper female casting director. It was a three-tiered audition, right? It was fully clothed audition. If you got through to the next round, you could, you could come back in, in bikinis or underwears. And then if you got through to the next round, it was a nude audition, right? And in hindsight, in 2023, you go, well, that's just stupid, right? I can, I can do that. I can open, I can put my hands up and say that. But if people think that I'm the only person that made that decision, you'd be sadly mistaken. You can't just go, this is what we're going to do. There's loads of people involved in those decisions, right? But going back to that, this is 2012, I think, right? And this audition goes to Spotlight. Spotlight is a place where you send breakdowns for auditions, right? I've still got the emails. It goes to Spotlight. Nobody has a problem with it. It goes to all the agents. Still got these emails. All the agents submit their actors. Still got all the emails, right? It wasn't, it's nothing sneaky about it. It was a three-tiered audition, right? And so it even says on the breakdown, it's not a lot of money. Do not send people that don't want to come in. No actors under the age of 23. It says it all on there. So the people that come in knew what they're coming in for. Not only did they know what they're coming in for, it wasn't one day. It was like over a three week process, maybe four weeks. I don't remember. Right. So then they come in. So the, the, the accusation is that the last one, uh, I filmed it. Well, they must have the video then. But I know they don't because there is no video. So why are you printing it? The casting director's in the article saying it didn't happen. But they bury that. They bury that. They say all these things you've done and they go, we spoke to the casting director who said there's absolutely no way this happened. But they bury that. No one reads that. No one's reading that. Once you read that, <gasps> retweet, clutch your pearls, monocle pops out, retweet. No one's reading that stuff. Because all the things you'd sent me so much information that obviously it's 20 accusations. What was the thing about the dick pic and on Snapchat? You know, they, they, they made out like 20 separate people. Like, a lot of these people were mates, right? And another thing like, oh, you, this person sent, sent me an unsolicited, I'm, I'm, poor innocent was sent an unsolicited dick. Not true. Not true. I, I don't want to get into the, 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 the ins and outs of it because it's stuff that will, will come out when it needs to come out. But I can assure you that that situation was more about adults having conversations with each other than it was about somebody preying on anyone. What about the bullying accusations? I mean, again, like, you know, what, what I will say about those things is like, I, I'm, a, I'm a tricky guy. I'm a very direct, straight down the line guy. This is another thing that people don't like about me is like, I'm pretty simple, man. If we start work at nine o'clock, come to work at nine o'clock. Don't come in at half past nine. Don't come in at 9.45. Don't tell people that you were picked on for coming into work 10 minutes late when actually you were two hours late. And you were two hours late because if someone's behaving inappropriately with somebody else and comes to work late because of that and are reprimanded for that reason, then they shouldn't be telling the newspaper that you bullied them because they were 10 minutes late. And that's, that's, just, that's just fact. It's a mad thing that you went through and it's messy, like 20 accusations and the thing was, it's not as if even if you get charges, there was no, the coppers didn't even investigate it. Didn't. There was no investigation with all these accusations that, like, see when you think your career's at the top, then all this comes out because what, you've been with your missus, what, 15, 20 yeah. years? Yeah. Four kids, yeah. father, try to do the right thing, yeah. been through a lot in your life. Yeah. When your wife sees that, what's it's, happening? It's horrible. Look, I, you know, because... I, I, I don't want to sit here and say to you, I'm the perfect son. I'm the perfect father. I'm the perfect husband. I'm the perfect friend. I'm the perfect man. I'm not, I'm, I'm flawed. Like I believe everybody else is. It seems like it's just me, but like I believe everyone else is, but I know what I'm not. I know what I'm not. I'm not an assaulter. I'm not a sexual predator. I'm not a fucking abuser. Right. And so for my family to see this, my mom, my wife, like it's just horrible. And again, it goes back to the same thing. Not only have I never had complaints with with my my agents and all that kind of stuff, we've never we've never had this sort of we've never had this sort of stuff in the whole time I've been with her. Do you know what I mean? I've never I've never raised my hand to a woman. I've never shout. I don't, we don't even have shouting matches. 
Like, you know, and, and what they're going to do now, you know, they're going to dig up in my past. All my ex-girlfriends still speak to me. Bar one. And she, and bar one, and she was an abuser. All of them. I've reached out to me, all of them messaged me. I saw one the other day, she gave me a big hug, how you doing? Like, oh my, what does that, what does that tell you? Like, if I can still legitimately speak to all my exes, my significant exes, you know, you, you kind of go, well, hold on a second. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and going back to that, sorry, just going back to that lateness, right? My thing is like, I don't care if someone wants to be inappropriate with someone. I'm, I'm not one of those people. I know the world has changed and people are not supposed to have liaisons or whatever, but I don't care. Do what you do outside in your private time, right? Just don't come to work late. It's, it's as simple as that, man. And when you're directing a film and you know that all those eyes are on you and all that pressure's on you, and basically, like, if that film doesn't work, nobody goes, oh, Bob the Sound Man, your film didn't work, mate. Your film didn't work, did it? Bob the Sound Man's on another job. No one goes, oh, oh Jim the Cameraman, oh, that film didn't work. Jim the Cameraman's on another job. If that film doesn't work, it's on me. So if I need you to come in at nine o'clock, come in at nine o'clock. If I tell you bring blue jeans, bring blue jeans, don't bring me red jeans unless you've told me the day before I can't get blue, I'm bringing red. That does, that's just who I am. And that makes me to people, I guess sometimes intimidating. I guess sometimes people go, well, you know, he's a bit too, he's a bit too, what's the word, forward? He's a bit too kind of stuff. Um, I don't know. And 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 the same with the, the thing. I've never had a conversation I think there's questions men have to ask themselves, right? I've never had a conversation with a woman that's being like sort of fruity or whatever that in, in my opinion or in my, as the, to the best of my knowledge wasn't mutual, right? So you have to look at yourself and you go, are you a harasser of women? I'm going like, no, I'm not a harasser of women. But every man has to go, has any woman ever felt harassed by you? That's a, that's a, different, that's a different thing. Women might have felt harassed by you without you realizing it, all right? So you now need to, I think what we need to do in society is look at sometimes intent. We need to look at intent because actually, you know what? There are, there are harassers, right? There are harassers, but there are also people that don't kind of realize how they're behaving or don't kind of realize how they are. Do you know what I mean? And if, if I'm guilty of anything, it may be that. Because no, there's, there's not even a person that can say to me, we've had these conversations and I told you to stop and you carried on. Never. Because if any, it even says in the article, when I said to that girl, you got a nice bum, which I did say, and she said, I oh, don't say that. I apologized to her. I was like, I'm so sorry. I, I'm really, really sorry. Do you know what I mean? And you know, everyone says 20 accusations, abuser and all this kind of stuff. Like my mum is a survivor. I know survivors, mate. I'm sorry if this offends people, but if somebody tells you your bum's nice, if somebody propositions you, allegedly propositions you at dinner, you say no and, and they go home. If somebody allegedly tells you that they like to pull long hair during sex, if somebody allegedly tells you um, they want to offer you a piece of dark chocolate in a, in a, you ain't, you ain't a survivor. Sorry, you're not. You may have survived other people, but in that situation, you ain't a survivor. That's, that's disrespectful to survive. I know survivors, mate. But it's clear you've ruffled some sort of feathers to then all those accusations and then for the Guardian to publish that. Like, what do you think's behind it? What do you, how do you think that's all came into fruition? I know who's behind it. There's things I can't say right now. I know who's behind it, uh, but uh, uh, it, it, it's just... Does it go a lot deeper than we it think? Go, it goes a lot deeper than we have time for goes a lot deeper than you than than you think. Um is is there's a, a lot of ruffled feathers involved. And I think that people people I think people took the opportunities to express their anger. I think people took the opportunities to express their they were they were they heard something that like this guy is this, this and this. Has he ever done this to you? No, but he did say this to me once. No, but he did say that to me once. I've got I've got women that text me that were like, we were called by the journalists and I had nothing negative to say about you. And basically we were sort of, 
it was ma- it was painted that if we spoke positive of you, we'd be labelled as victim blamers. I've got these texts. I got these texts from people that were called. I've got people that told me that things didn't happen, that they told them, and then they still printed the things, but they didn't quote those persons. They didn't quote those people as as saying it. Like it is, there was an agenda from people to get me because I'm disliked and I ruffle feathers and I'm 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 uppity and I'm not in my lane and. If you say to me, have you ever been inappropriate? And uh, yeah, of course I've said inappropriate things. I can, I'm, I'm in my forties, mate. When I grew up, when I grew up, we didn't swipe on phones. You went out and you met people and you chatted them up or you got chatted up. You walked through a club, girls grabbed your arm. Do you know what I mean? You, you, you walked through a club, you like, you asked for numbers and people gave you, people gave you a fake number if they didn't like you. And if they liked you, you got the real number. And then, then you went out with them. There was no apps. There was no sort of, do you know what I mean? But also for me, there's like, I'm not, there's no intent there. It's not, it's not, it's not in my nature. It's not, it's not a thing that, that I believe I do. And, and, you know, I've seen so much of this stuff. Like I, I can basically, Go through that whole thing. You know what? I, I, I'm happy. I would be happy to on here or anywhere to sit opposite those journalists and go. Let's go through it one by one. Have all the I can have all the lawyers sitting there. Let's go through it one by one. Let's go through the whole thing one by one. And you go. This is what so and so said. And I go. Oh well. Here you go. Here's here's those facts. Here these here are these texts. Here are these emails. Here's this that and the other. And let's do that. Let's do that live and and let's see what. Let's see, let's see who comes out of it at the end. So over the last two years, look, has anyone had your back? Very few people. I mean, you know, very few people. But before that, I just want to say like, it didn't stop there, you know, there was, there was other things. Like they, they, and let's just give you an example. They, they came after me for, so they, the, the show I mentioned earlier, the Channel 5 show, the drowning. They came. They came after me for the drowning, and said on the set on the set of the drowning that I bullied and harassed these two women, and it was awful. The environment in our office was toxic, and this, that, and the other, and blah, 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 blah. And um, a third woman witnessed this and said it was like Clark was kicking puppies. That's how bad the bullying was. It was like I was kicking puppies. We're printing this as well. What you got to say? So I was, I was in South Africa shooting Bulletproof. I wasn't on the drowning. I wasn't on set. I wasn't in prep. I wasn't on shoot. I wasn't even there. So how have you got two people and a witness that said like, it, it was, there was, there was, it was, do you know what I mean? They didn't print that in the end because I think it was one too far because I weren't even in the country. But my point is, is like when people go like, if this has happened, it's fact. It's like, it's not, it's not always the case. Because they cancelled the last episode of your point as well. Pulled it off air. Eh? So when your whole world's come crumbling down, like the accusations, like no matter who you are, that's the worst thing you can say to any man. Yeah. Like over the torment and the misery, everything has went through, no charges, no investigation, no nothing. Like over that period, like because you ended up suicidal thoughts. Like when was the darkest moment for you? When did it all come crashing down? A father who's got four kids, a missus who loves them, but you had the thoughts of enough's enough. Uh, well, I think. Yeah, I did. I, and I, I want to get to that. I just want to say before that, I just want to say like, our company was doing such great things. And I don't just mean like, oh, we were succeeding. Like we had, we had two greenlit movies. We had two greenlit TV shows. We were, we had a bunch of other things that were happening. There was a book deal, a, a novel for me. It was an animated show with a kids, kids, uh, kids animated show. And we had all these things right happening. We, we had, um, we had a hot desk in our office where young writers could come and just write and be around us. They didn't hear all the meetings, but just be around us. We were, we were bastions of diversity. Like we had all sorts of people that could just come through and, and, and take meetings with us and speak to us. We were doing shows that were all female writers rooms, all black writers rooms, all multicultural. Like we were doing all sorts of, all sorts of things. We just started a program where young offenders, people that are offended who sort of had no chance of getting into the business, were getting them into the business. I just got, getting them into the business. I just got a guy to be the lead composer on a TV show. 
who had been in jail, was good at music, and I got it signed off, got it, got it signed off by the, the broadcaster and all that. Like we were doing like such amazing things like in, in the company. To give back? To give back, to get more people like us through the door, like consistently. You know what I mean? We just got a, a, a bunch of books that were by a black writer that had just kind of been struggling for a while. Nobody wanted to make them. I got that stuff green lit. We just got it green lit. We got it, we got it built and met like, we were doing so many things. So we were so, it wasn't about just me being high. The company was, was so high and was such a different energy, such a different company, like such a vibe. Like if a young writer just went, oh, can I come and write in the office at your hot day? Be like, yeah, come in. It, we didn't advertise it because it would have been like full on, but you know, just come in. And they would come in, they would be writing and, you know, see us and be around. Like we were doing such, amazing positive things for the business that I know other companies aren't doing. There's no companies that are doing, getting offenders, literally offenders, not just an assistant. I got this guy to be the composer of a TV show. And the broadcasters are like, it's on you, you know, it's on you. I'm like, yeah, fine. It's on, it's on us. It'll be on us. Signed off. Do you know what that would have done for his life? You compose a TV show. You're gone, mate. After that, you are respect, you, you'll be in the door. And that would have changed his life. You know, we were doing all these things. And so when it happened, all of that, it's not just about, it's not just about me or my, about my business partner. It's everyone around you. It's everything. Every TV show that got pulled, Bulletproof cancelled. Viewpoint pulled off, which was going into another season. The two greenlit shows, so essentially four shows we had. The two greenlit shows that were were building up, right? One of them was in prep. So you got about you think about three hundred jobs on each of those shows. About three hundred jobs on each of those shows, gone. We had seven women in our company, right? You talk about me as this this guy. This, uh, we had seven women in our company. Four people that were there every day and three sort of satellites, kind of, you know, seven. Me and my business partner and seven women. Did any of them ever come up forward against you? They were not even called. You're doing an investigation into a man and what he's like. Surely you've got to call the women that work with me. Seven. Some of them were with us for five years. Some of them are with me for five years, every single day. Apart from weekends, obviously, and sometimes weekends and sometimes trips away to Toronto Film Festival and all that. Some of them were with me for five years. Not only did they not, they weren't even called. No, they weren't even, if you, how can you investigate and not call people that have been working with him for five years or working with him every day? Not one of them are called and they range from the ages of 21 to like 55, sorry, like 50. Not, none of them were called. What was the prank for? The old one? Oh, mate. So, but what's the connection with all that? So there was um, one of the articles slammed us um, for doing this horrible prank on on one of the main accusers, um, and it was a, a prank where my business partner has an allergic reaction, and then we get the phone call that we have to pee pee on her, and I'm like, "You got to pee on him! You got to pee on him! Get your fanny out! Pee on him! Pee on him! Pee on him!" And they blasted us. It's all in the thing. Blasted us, and like. I think she's quoted in the article, like trauma to, I, I don't remember, but you know, we just got absolutely ripped for that one, destroyed. And if you go on Channel 5's website, there's a thing called pranks. Of the, like, she, she knew about it. She knew about it, but no one's, no one's admitted that. She knew about it. She organized it. The whole thing. It wasn't, it wasn't even a prank, to be honest with you. It wasn't even a prank. It was all set up. But no one's, no one's gone, come forward or gone, oh, I stand by everything else, but that was me. No one said anything. They're just like, so we just, we just, we just died in the war. And he's, he's, he's lost everything as well. What was the two women at GQ? Yeah, the journalists. What was all that about? Like, what they, when they, they were told to investigate you? The way they, yeah, they, they said that they were told to do it and they did it and it was a three week investigation and it was easy because so many people were coming forward and this, that and the other, but like what? He said my mum was not, like what? I don't, so many people were coming forward. 
like mate, like, and then they did a GQ interview and, 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 you know, I guess bragging, like celebrating their, celebrating their, celebrating what they did. It's interesting because Sharin Kale did an interview talking about like they, they, they tried to be fair and empathetic and, and, um, and balanced and there's no malice. Everything about what they did was malicious and it wasn't fair. Because you can't, you can't, she also says on that same interview that sometimes she does investigations that are a year long and, and makes mistakes. How can you do a three week investigation and think that everything is accurate? And in that interview, they're like, oh, it was, it was a race against time. It was a race against time. We needed to get the story out. Why? Where was I going? Where was I going? What was it? Was I leaving the planet? What, 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 why was there a race against time? I don't, I don't understand it. Surely getting it right, surely getting it right, getting all these things, they demonized me, criminalized me, dehumanized me, emasculated me and everything with all these stuff, accused me of criminal things. So you got to go to the police, take those to the police, take those to the police. I could be at home having Sunday dinner, get on a knock on the door. Can you come to the station and bring all your, bring your phone and whatnot? And then get me nabbed if it's real. And then once I'm nabbed, put your article out. That happens to everybody else. How come it didn't happen to me? That seems to happen to everyone else. You hear about it, so-and-so is being arrested and you're like, oh my God. So why was it different for me? What was, what was the race against time? Uh, what was the race against time? Why do you think it happened to you? They, want, they had an agenda. They just wanted to get someone. And it was perfect timing because there were people that didn't like me, wanted to get me. And look, I can hold my hands up and say, look, man, have I spoke to people that I now look back and go, oh, maybe you shouldn't have spoken to them like that. Sure. Doesn't make you a bully. I can hold my hands up and go, ah, do you know what? Did you ever say something inappropriate to that person? So, yeah, maybe. Or did you, you know, have you ever in your years, have you ever tried your luck with someone? Yeah, maybe. Do you know what I mean? That doesn't make you a sexual predator. That makes you a, a human being and a flawed one, but everyone's flawed. You can still be an ally and not be perfect. Do you know what I mean? Like two things can happen at the same time. I, I've been like, I've been, I've been a gym instructor, a lifeguard, a personal trainer. I've worked on poolside, saunas, steam rooms. I've been around semi-clothed women my whole life and never had a complaint. How am I? How am I suddenly this guy? See me again through all that then, and the dark clouds come over you. You've been accused of everything. You've lost your jobs. People around you have lost their jobs. Your wife and kids would no doubt feel the effects. But when did it come on top for you mentally? Because you'd have been in survival mode, not knowing really where to go, where to turn. But when did it come on top for you mentally? Well, we just, as I said, we just escaped. We just went somewhere where our friends let us stay. And then the hounds, the hounds came. They were just there, man. The, the press were out. They hounded my mum. Hounded my mum. Eight-year-old woman hounded her. Do you know what I mean? I think one of them forced her to say something at, at some stage. You know what I mean? Like, well, well, your son, your son. Eight-year-old woman. They were outside my house for like eight weeks. Mm, six weeks, maybe. Like, my neighbours were telling them to fuck off and throwing shit out. Like, it was just, it was on top. The state, the statement came out immediately, like, um, <clears throat> sorry for this I believe some of my actions have affected people in ways I did not realise I'm sorry but I don't know mate you think I wrote that statement I was not even coherent that statement was written by a woman that ran into the fire when everyone was running out and I, I got nothing but love for her but she didn't know me she didn't know me so she had to kind of just balance it in, in you know a, that was almost the worst thing that ever happened because the moment I said that, people were like, well, he must be guilty. And in my heart, I just knew like, well, no, like I'm guilty of being a normal person and making mistakes for sure, but no, no. But she wrote, she wrote that statement, fine. Like obviously I would have had to sign off on it, but mate, I do not remember anything. It was just like the darkest sort of, I just can't, and everybody ran. Everybody ran. All those people on that Zoom that said business as usual and all this kind of stuff, they ran. 
excuse me, agents ran, employers ran, broadcasters ran. BBC put out a statement like, we'll never, we're not going to work on any Clark projects. Why? Because of comments on Doctor Who from 2004, alleged comments from Doctor Who from 2004, comments. ITV pulled viewpoint off the air. Sky counseled bulletproof. My employers suspended us, kicked us out, eventually took our company. I got kicked off shows I created. The shows I created, I got kicked off. I got my name taken off scripts I've written. I was in the Padd Paddington animated show. They put out a statement. We're going to not play any episodes where his voice is. What's my voice going to do? What's my voice going to do? Ooh, come out of the TV and, and molest people. Like, what's my voice going to do? Like, it's, it was unreal. Unreal. But like, if that's happening to someone, then they better have done some, I mean, they got to have done some real crazy shit, right? Because there's there's footballers and other people that are doing allegedly doing shit and keeping their jobs. The clubs are going, well, this is, you know, this has happened. We're going to wait to the outcome of any proceedings and then we're going to decide what we're going to do. I didn't get any of that stuff. There's certain people that um, when their things came out, they were told, oh, we'll, we'll delay their shows um, until further notice or they've kept their agents. There's actors being accused of things 10 times worse who kept their agents. I lost everything in 24 hours. Every single thing I worked for for 20 years was gone in 24 hours. You have a suicide though? Yeah. Like I was just like, what's the point? I feel like we got to where we were going and then I was just, it was just early on. I was like, I'm out of here, I'm done. I can't understand why. I can't understand why. So I don't understand why you would do this to someone. For people to do this to you, this is evil. I don't care like what people want to go, yeah, but you, no, this is evil. For people to want to do this to you, you had to be evil. I'm not evil. I know that. I don't even, now, two years later, I can sit here. I don't care what they call me because I know I'm not that. But at the time, it was just the worst. I hate fucking people like this. I hate it. I'm a guy, that, I'm the guy that, Saw a woman getting beaten up and I was one of the only two men that tried to stop it. Guy pulls a knife on me and then she tells me to mind my fucking business. But I was there, man. I was there like, stop you and I stop hitting her, bro. Like, you're going to stop hitting her and me. I'm a guy that opens doors for women. I was reading vagina monologues when my mates were still laughing at the word. I was tweeting about period poverty when my mates were still making jokes about keeping away. Ooh, I'll keep away from the missus for five days. <laughs> and I'm like, mate, grow up. Do you know what I mean? I offer seats in the tube until I got told I was positively discriminating. Do you know what I mean? Why would you offer me that seat? Would you have offered it to an able-bodied man? She was right though. I had to really think about that and go, well, actually you're right, but I wasn't doing it to be a positive discriminator. I was well, I was raised to be polite. Do you know what I mean? Now I don't do that. I'm not doing it. The, gr the Grim Reaper's got to be on your shoulder or the baby's got to be waving at me. If I ain't seeing one of those two things, you ain't getting a seat. I'm just sitting there like, that's how I am now. But that's how I'm raised, bro. Like, when a funeral procession goes by, you take your hat off. When a woman leaves the table, you stand up, you open doors, you go for seats. You know what I mean? Like, it's just a word. I, I can't stand people like this. This, where I'm from, you don't harm kids. You don't do shit to women. Like, that's just standard procedure. Mm -hmm. You're a wrong, you're a wrong. And so for them to label me this, it's, it's so fucking far from who I am. It's not even, it's, it would be funny if it wasn't so devastating. Were you ever close to taking it on life? Yeah. Yeah. There's two days in particular, I reckon I carried the knife in my pocket for like six weeks. And then there was one day I was just like, yeah, this is the day, man. I think they were going for a walk or whatever. And I was like, yeah, this is the day. And then my son asked me to get something on the shelf and it fell out of my pocket. And he said, why have you got that, daddy? And it kind of just jolted me a bit. And I was like, ah, uh, it's to clean the dirt out of my nails. And he was like, oh, okay. And I just thought, okay, just put it away 
just put it away. That was the that was the day. Um and it was another day when um I was really getting down there again and, and this actor friend called me. And him and his wife spoke to me for four hours on the phone. Four hours. So there's been there's been people, you know, there's been some people that have that have been there. But generally most people ran. But my wife, my wife's there. <laughs> she read this. She read it. She knows these people. She knows who's involved. She knows these people. She's seen what they've done, who they are. <laughs> One of them was texting her, texting her, I'm praying for you. And then the fucker was involved in the whole thing. Dog. Absolute fucking dog. Text her like two days in, I'm praying for you, hope you're okay. And then we find out that he's involved in the whole thing. And I say he because it's a guy. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's like, it's so... It's complex. But like, if you're painted as this, then you, you, you know who you are, right? The police, to this day, and this is the main thing that you know, people need to understand, you know, the papers tried to print this thing. Again, this same one, this, this Sharon Carly, they printed this thing about it's been dropped for lack of evidence. That's not true. I wasn't reported. There were no complaints. The first contact I had with police was months after when I reported the false allegations. I reported some false allegations and blackmail that was happening. That was all, all kind of involved in it. And I reported these things. I went to the police. I sat in there for three days going through them. Right, right. This person, this is, this is what is showing them all the evidence, showing them all this, 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 this. I reported it, you know, it wasn't a joke, mate. They took it seriously. I had the police come around my house, detectives come around my house and go, Mr. Clark, female detectives, Mr. Clark, if we look into these false allegations and they turn out not to be false, you know, we're going to have to come back and get you. Are you sure you want to go forward with this? I said, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. And they went off. And they came back a few weeks later and they're like, we can't take any of this further. I said, why not? Why not? That, why not? There's no allegations made against you. We've checked all the systems across, across the police forces. There's no, there's no reports, there's no complaints, there's no allegations made against you. I said, how do I get that in writing? I said, you apply for your freedom of information under the, you, you apply for your right of access under the Freedom of Information Act. It will take a few months. So how do I do that? Send me the things. And I've done that and I applied for that paperwork. And I applied for it in February, got it in July. You've never been reported for anything in your whole life. Ever. No matter where I'm from, all my friends, all the things my friends done, I've never been reported for anything in my whole life. Have you got any charges? Nothing. Any convictions? Nothing. So see everybody that turned their back against you? Family, friends? Yeah. People you've worked with? Not family. Not family. So no. they, yeah, but you can understand all those accusations. One or two, you think, do you know what? I'm going to have your back 20. You're thinking, fuck me, like, that's a lot. Yeah, they ran. You could probably understand how people walked, walked away, but what about with Ashley Walters, who you've worked with through the years, who you've been tight with? Like, how did that go with him? Did he have your back? He did not, but it's just... Look, I, I've I've seen him. I'm I'm you know I'm fed up with people controlling my narrative, and you know a lot of people don't know this. I've seen him. We've spoken, um, and I won't say what we've spoken about, but I will say this: like, I've never seen Ashley behave in any way, shape, or form like that, and he's never seen me behave like that. That's the be all and end all, right? But also, when I saw him, I just said to him, I would have never, I would never have done that to you. I just wouldn't have done it to you, right? And it's not about, it's not about slamming anyone or guilt. I, lo I love the guy. We, we've been through so much together from, from, from being people that didn't know each other, didn't really like each other to becoming like in my pocket. Like we were in each other's pocket. That's my, that's my guy. And I still, right now I'd be like, that's my guy. Like I, I don't have no bad words to say about him, but you know, people do what they have to do because they have to, do you know what I mean? It's like, what, what's he supposed to do? If, 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 if he if he stood by me, then he would have got blasted. 
And I don't mean because he'd done anything, he would have just got blasted. And that's the same with what everyone else we're talking about. If people stood by me, they would have just got blasted. Do you know what I mean? And so I got nothing but love for him. You know what you I mean? You see that then, why people really? kind of turn their back. But again, if it's a brother, if it's loyalty for me, I'm sticking by my, my boys yeah. until the fucking da death. Like if it comes out and people are charged left, right and centre, people get prison, I'd be like, well, I fucked up, I'm sorry, but yeah. I still had to have his back. That's yeah. the way I've been raised, that's the way I've been brought up. To that's the way I've been raised I've too. I've his back one million percent, man. Like, one of your boys phones you and, and you're there and it's the worst thing you could ever see and he needs your help. Listen, you, you're there now, you've got to help him. What I learned through therapy is like, we can't expect everyone to be the way we are. Mm -hmm. That's been a real tough lesson for me real tough lesson because I think part of my, my my flaws and part of my failings is like if I give you the shirt off my back sometimes I think people give me the shirt off their back and actually you have to realize not everyone not everyone's like that people are different like I'm a communicator you know I'm a hugger I'm very tactile you know he says the, the, their lawyers are writing that down tactile oh. um yeah do you know what I mean so so but other people aren't like that you know you meet someone you ain't seen in years and you go to hug them and they go Good to meet you and you're like fuck is wrong with you you're shaking my hands do you know what i mean but people people are different so uh I, yeah i got love for him man and I, I hope one day that you know i think the, the best thing that I could the, the one thing i know he said was that um that, that i will say is that he wouldn't mind doing the, the show again one day and so if they if they, if anyone actually looked at this and were like why did we actually cancel this guy's life let's pick up that show let's do the show we had, we had such a banging season ready to go. He's busy now. I'm not busy, but... Yeah, I mean? but like, things like this can change the game like, yeah. and change everything. Let's like, see everything that you went through with no charges pressed, no investigation. Nothing. Have you ever had a sorry? No. From no one. At no point. BAFTA, BAFTA you know, as I, as I said at the beginning, like, not at the beginning, when we were talking about it, like, the way they acted um, up until that point, you can't can't make a complaint, but afterwards they were disgraceful. They put out a statement, seven hundred and something words. You know, they, their statement for Harvey was like two hundred words, and they had parties for that guy every year. Do you know what I mean? Like seven hundred words, like what? Like what? Do you know what I mean? And then, you know, and it just went from there. They've just suspended my membership. My took rescinded my award. Took my suspended my award. Did just like, and there's been no. There's no, there's no sorry. There's no kind of like, well, hold on a second. There's been no charges, no investigation. Let's, let's kind of all go. Let's all take a breath and go, do you know what? Here's it back. Here's a restart. Here's a second chance. And you know what? I'm not even saying second chance because I'm like, I, 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 in my opinion, I'm like, well, I, why do I need a second chance? This was, this was deeper than people think. It's not a case of I'm sitting there like, boo hoo, James, I've done all these things. Please forgive me. It's like, I hold my hands up, mate. Like I'm not, I'm not perfect. I'm, I'm flawed. I've been flawed since I was young. I've been a drama magnet since I was young. I've been tricky. I'm a weird guy. Like, you know what I mean? I just am like, but a lot of people are. Do you know what I mean? Half, half, half 80% of the actors I know have done worse on, on that list on, on, on a weekend that can. And 50% of the women. I don't smoke, I don't party, I don't do any drugs, I don't, I don't go out. Like, there's a lot of people that can't say that. And I think if you're, if you're a newspaper that's gonna blast people, then you need to make sure the people that you're using to blast them have not been acting in ways that are worse than he's been acting. But that that will that will that's all that's all gonna come out. Like it's it's all gonna come out. It, it, one way or another, it's gonna come out. Like if it comes out in court, great. If if I don't if I don't get there, and it has to come out a different way, it's gonna come it's gonna come out. Like I can't, you can't just you can't just do this to people. You just can't do this to people. Do you know what I mean? I just, it's not. You literally just turn somebody's life upside down for, for now what? I'm sitting in limbo. It's not even like I've gone in there and been like, okay, he's out of trial or anything like that. Nothing, n absolutely nothing. To be no charges. To well, be I no, could just be a super to, villain to and, be, and hidden it all these years. Yeah. 
but I actually fucking speak to those mad bastards. Like, we've all got hidden agendas. We've all got madness. We're all wired did. up wrong. We're they made out up. like I'm a super villain. Like yeah. I'm not only the, sorry to interrupt that's you, but what, that's yeah. what they did, man. It was like, it was a secret. So immediately everyone who had never heard it, all my agents and all the people that never heard it was like, it's a secret. That's why we never knew. It was very clever. It was very, very, very clever. They made out like, not only was I doing these things, but I was villainous enough to keep really it. devious stuff. Yeah. yeah. But horrible, man. For women who, like, I don't, like, there's plenty of victims out there. I've had plenty of survivors on the show, so I know how hard that is for people to come forward. But if these women are making up lies and they come together, these women should be sent to prison. These women should be getting the book thrown at them. Do you know what I mean? There's no convictions against you. There's no charges there's no investigation, so something's not right. No, it gets to the bottom to it. And like, I don't have all the answers for the people who's come forward, but I can only take it from what you showed me, the things that you've you've put across yeah. to me, and it's something's not you right. Ain't about seen, it. You ain't seen the half of it, mate. And and the thing is, is it's you know I'm honest enough to sit here and go, it's not just lies. Some of it's got uh, elements of truth in it. There's like there's embellishment and there's context and stuff like that. Do you know what I mean? It's like it, it, it's like. Did he tell you off of being late? Yeah, he did. But you didn't say why you were like, do you mean there's context and stuff like that? But what I will say is like, I don't feel like women have to do anything. Women don't owe us nothing. Men are still the problem, right? Generally. Femicide is, an, is endemic. It's a, it's a problem. The treatment of women is, is a problem. Like, you know, I think w what needs to be looked at, like I said earlier, is 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 in, is intent as well. Like you can't, you shouldn't blast a guy for having sexist opinions who you've not tried to educate, who you've not tried to change, who you've not spoken to. You know, is a difference, right? You got. I know we we'll probably run out of time to edit, but you got. You know, let's say you got like boy A, boy C, B, and boy C, right? And they all kick puppies. And boy A kicks a puppy and he's caught kicking the puppy. They all kick these puppies, right? And you catch boy A and you're like, hey, you don't ever kick them fucking puppies, man. And he's like, he cries. I'm so sorry. I've, I didn't realize that puppies felt pain, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, all right, cool. You know what I mean? Just don't do it again. And he goes off and he becomes a pet shop owner, whatever like that. You go to boy B, you don't kick those puppies. And boy B's like, fuck you, man. I'll kick any puppies I want. I'm going to kick more puppies. The moment I get out of here, I'm going to kick more puppies. And you're like, these guys are wrong. And there's a lot of them, you are, this guy's a wrong one, right? You're banned from the park, you're banned from anywhere, we don't want you around dogs, whatever like that. He's like, fuck you, whatever like that. And then you got boy C, and boy C is the same as boy A. He's like, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, like, I really didn't mean it. But society punishes him the same as boy B. Like, it's different. And if you keep punishing boy C's like boy B, you're just going to get him angry. You're going to get them angry, and they're going to fester, and they're going to get wild and then one day that anger is going to come out and then a boy C becomes a boy B as well like you have to look at intent you have to look at like just because somebody may have sexist views it doesn't make them a sexist and you know what I can say that because when other people want to use it they use it when people want to cover racism they go unconscious bias well maybe I had some unconscious bias and I need to work on that. So do you know why can't there be unconscious sexism? Why can't it be there's some guys who have got views that if you sat them down and educated them, they would lose those views. Because if they can if that can happen with unconscious bias, then it can happen here, right? And there's some guys that just don't want to learn. But I think we need to be able to identify intent. We need to be able to go, right, these people can the ones that can't be educated and are a problem, they should be jailed, cast out, whatever. I don't believe anyone's life should be cancelled, but they should be whatever. But if you can educate, right, you can educate and you can change people and you can show them. For example, if they really thought, they really looked at that stuff and goes, well, there's actually nothing criminal here or these things we can't prove or whatever, but we want to blast him anyway, right? You could have spoken to Time's Up. They could have spoke to Time's Up. They could have spoke to all my agents. They could have spoke to all this stuff without the newspaper stuff, right? They didn't have to ruin my life. They could have done all that kind of stuff and they could have come to me and gone, we think you've done all these things. What do you have to say about it? And we are going to do a story. And if it was real, if it was all real and I'd be like, fucking hell, I'm so sorry. I did not realize that I was perceived that way. I did not realize I was doing these things. How can I help you? How can I change? How can I be better? which is what we should all do. Because even in my statement, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry if anyone ever felt 
away. I really am genuinely sorry. If I've made anyone feel certain ways, I am. But it doesn't make you that person, right? So if you go, I want to change, how can I help? And they go, this is how you can change. You can be a, you can you can start actually educating other people. Can you imagine the ally that someone like myself, if that was all real, when someone like myself came out and went, I'm really grateful I won this thing, but do you know what I've realized? It's come to my attention over the years, I've possibly been inappropriate at times and blah, 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 blah. And I'd like to take this opportunity to go, I'm here for change. And I'm going to be an example for all other guys to be better. And you know what? The truth is, James, I still want to be that. I want to be that guy that can take this experience and say to other guys, mate, don't flirt. Don't say that. Keep your head down. Do your work. Have fun, but not too much. Like, do you know what I mean? Because I'm not one of those people that believe there should be no flirt and there should be no interaction. I think like we should live. We're humans, right? But at the same time, if I can help other people and stop other people from creating resentment and getting women angry or actually from creating real victims, like I would love to be that guy, but I would have been, I was, I thought I was doing that anyway. Oh. I thought I was an ally anyway, honestly. Oh. I'm a feminist, I'm a philogenist, I'm a person that I, I respect, as far as I th knew, as far as I thought, I respected women. You know what I mean? But times have changed. Like you look on fucking TikTok and all the social media platforms, girls are filming men and filming them myself and gyms, men are maybe looking over and the guys are getting called creeps, this and that. Like, I know. Fucking, we, we get the rough end of the stick. Look, fucking men are, we, we I mean, and people are too scared to speak out. Look, fuck everybody else. Yeah. You can speak to people. It's a way of yeah. communication. You can pass a flirtatious comment. You can, if you're single, then you, you should be able to. I see men try to talk to women and they're calling them fucking creeps and perverts. And I'm thinking, fucking shut up. Yeah, I, 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 I agree with you to the most point. I think that we still are in a position like where. I don't have to stand on a tube, on a crowded tube and think someone's going to touch my, my, my goodies in the tube. I mean, weirdly it has happened to me from a woman, but that was years ago. But like, but that's, a, that's a very rare, rare thing. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But that's happened to family members of mine. Do you know what I mean? A lot of women. So we do get the rough end of the stick, but no, we do get the stick, but I still think like it's balanced the other way. Like yeah. if, if I'm honest, I don't have to, I don't have to walk down an alleyway at night thinking someone's going to pin me down and, and yeah, of course. stick shit in me. Like, I don't, do you know what I mean? We might think we might get robbed or stabbed. So I, I still think there's, there's an imbalance there. Yeah, and it's still, got to be boundaries. I've got a yeah, bit of understanding, but it's still our, it's still our, yeah. it's still our issue. It really is. But I think what harms me the most or hurts me the most is the fact that I've always thought that, but they've painted me as, as the opposite. They've painted me as the opposite. And when you see, like, when you see, like, you know, I'm, 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 I'm scattering here, but when you see who's involved, when you see, like, this guy that's been stalking me and harassing my family and all that kind of stuff is, is that when, when you start to see all of this kind of stuff, you know, it will, it will, it will make sense. When can you put all that stuff out? Well, at the minute, it's just going to have to be in court, isn't it? What happened to your Stephen Bartlett interview? He pulled it down. Why? Ask him. I think that he was, you know, because I'd just done that interview two weeks before and then it was, I, 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 and I liked the guy, you know what I mean? And I was I was happy to be on it and all that. And then he pulled it down. My, my belief actually is that the BBC told him to do it. Not that it's any of their business, but this is the kind of level of, of cancellation that people were really trying to put on me. It's like they were telling people that had their own private things to just take shit down. You know, BAFTA was deleting my pictures off their website and, and taking my links to like, it's just disgrace. It's like, oh, the smelly kid at school, the smelly kid at school, everyone run away from the smelly kid at school. And and no one's going, well, well hold on, why did he smell? Does he have parents at home? Is it, does that, like, nobody's cared. My PR company is supposed to, this is their job. Stuff like, stuff like this happens. That's what PR companies are for. That's what you pay them for. They fucking ran, ran. And then put out a thing saying they had complaints from, from a, a client. It's, fact, it's, it's a mistruth. This is a woman I complained to them about six months previous. I complained to them about her six months previous. 
So if this woman's been talking shit about me, should we all have a sit down and iron it out? And they were like, no, leave it, leave it, leave it. And then in the papers, it's like, yeah, mate, it, the, the whole thing is... Messy. It, it's messy. It is messy. Like, I don't want to sit here and go, it's simple. Like, I've... I've my personality, my my vibe, my my energy, my my sort of my patterns that I have because I cut people off, right? If you because of my loyalty and my patterns and you know my my grudges, like uh, what's his name, the journalist I told you that said they're gonna play the thing at the funeral, and I was like, who's funeral? If someone wrongs me like that, I just cut them off. I just um, cut them off. Ruthless that way. Is I just, I like, don't. There's yeah. no. I, before you walk out the room, I'm deleting your number. I'm blocking. Like you can't mm. contact me, and people don't like that. Yeah. People that it. But also, even if you don't do that and you become successful, people don't like that either. Yeah. Never mind just cutting them off because I've also got that grievance with they. Like you with that don't. journalist for 15 years, you're doing that to somebody hurts their feelings. So they want to see you bad. 100%. So when they see you doing that, they're thinking, yes. 100%. 100%. 100%. Like, 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. But I think when you've cut people off and then you continue to succeed, it burns them in a different oh, way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It burns them in a different way. And I've, you know, I, I've, you know, I've not said anything here to jeopardize a thing, but let me tell you something. I have facts. Everything I have, everything I'm saying to you or have, I've not said to you, or I've skirted around or hinted, I've got facts. I've got fact. I've got fact. I've got information. I've got evidence. I've got everything. At the time, I was so lost. Like, I've never seen death before. Like, and I was literally there. Like, I was so lost. I, I just was like... Just deny that, deny that's not true, that's not true. And these, as I said, these lawyers, this PR woman that came, they didn't know me. You know what I mean? So I just said what I said, but I've got, I've got, every, I've spent 18 months collecting everything. I have everything. I have everything. Why are you telling your story now? Because I'm not angry anymore. I can sit here and smile. I'm not angry anymore. Like if I, if I, even if I go to court with them and I lose, I don't give a fuck, man, because what are they going to call me? If I lose, someone's going to go, they were right, you're a bully and a sexual predator. I know I'm not that. I know I'm not that. I'm a, I'm a, I'm imperfect, but I'm a, I'm a father, I'm a husband, I'm a, uh, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a son, I'm a friend. I'm not perfect to any of those, but I'm fucking great at them. Do you know what I mean? And so if I lose and you're gonna, you're gonna say, hammer down, you are a bully, you are a sexual predator, and now you owe all this money. Well, I ain't got it. Firstly, I don't have it, I don't have it. So you're going to make my kids homeless publicly. You're going to do that publicly. I don't have it. And you're going to call me names you've already called me. But you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to show you who they are. I'm going to show you who they are. I'm going to show you what they did. I'm going to show you who's involved. I'm going to show you how they did it. And then everyone's going to be like, oh, this is interesting. So I, I'm not angry anymore. I forgive, I forgive most of these people. Yeah, that's the most important thing. But that's a difficult thing. You look at the Johnny Depp case. It's clear that women can be devious. It's clear that women can fucking fuck shit up, man. And, and, but like I say, he's done this to me or he's done that. Any woman that says anything like against a man, the man's charged straight away. Yeah. It's the worst thing in the world. But there's you, no things to protect men. There's no things in place. Wait a minute, that she could be lying. Like, the Johnny Depp case has been so good for men to understand that, wait a minute, the yeah. shit that was made up to throw that yeah. bastard under the bus, he lost jobs. He got kicked off Pirates of the Caribbean, yeah. the poor bastard. No, but he's still Johnny Depp though. Yeah, he's still Johnny. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not. I ain't Johnny Depp, and <laughs> you could put all twenty of mine together. It weren't as bad as what he was accused of, yeah. but I'm still sitting here. Do you know what I'm saying? I'm still sitting here, like with with not with absolutely nothing. But I'm not. I'm not angry anymore. But things can change. Where do you go forward for the future, brother? I'm writing. I'm writing. I just want to work. I'm not interested. You know, I, I'm not interested in friends. But again, I was never interested in friends. Um. I just want to work, man. I just want to work and, you know, there, there are people that have been there. I can't even mention, this is, this is the level of, I can't even mention the people that have been there for fear that they get targeted. Do you yeah, know what I mean? Bit, it's yeah, crazy, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Um, so for me, I'm just now, I, I just want to work, man. I want people, I want these channels, I want the channels to go, well done. Actually, why, why did we do that? Actually, like what, it's two years on. Like it's not even a, you know, and, and, you know, I'm probably not going to get apologies because they don't they don't do this. But I just want to work. Just want to work. It's sad to think that try and build your career back, but you've not been charged with anything. Mm -hmm. You've not been investigated. Nothing. For anything nothing. Like that. But whoever's done that is sitting at the big round table, and they've they've clearly got some fucking pull. You don't get that level of cancellation without fucking doing something where they think I don't like him. 
Well, well, it is interesting. I know we're wrapping up, but this is interesting because actually what it comes down to is this, right? It's not really about, I, I truly believe that uh, some of these women believe their reality, right? Because I said to someone the other day, a psychologist, well, this woman's lying. She's like, well, that's the, her reality. I truly believe, what's the word they use? My truth. I am truly believe they've got their truth, right? Well, I've got my truth and my truth is the truth, in my opinion, right? But I, I truly believe that. It doesn't bother me because I know I, I know what's what, right? And we're going we're gonna to get there, right? But I think what you have to understand is even if they had their anger and they did what they did, the vitriol after, the reaction afterwards, all the cancellation, that's based on other stuff. That's based on, we just don't like this guy because he's not supposed to be here. I'm not supposed to be here, mate. I should be in jail with my mates or have served my sentence and come out. Like, I'm not supposed to be here. I'm like, I'm like the anomaly in the major. I'm like the, I, I'm not supposed to be there. Single father, uh, single mother, council estate, rough area, didn't do great in school. I should not be here. And every time they put an obstacle in my way, I went around it, over it, under it, and I kept succeeding every single time. And every time they said, you're not going to do it, I was like, I am going to do it. They put me in, th they're like, you're not going to do theatre, Olivier. You ain't going to do films, BAFTA. You're not going to get in TV, Doctor Who, Bulletproof. Like every time, you know, someone says, I hate him. He's not good enough. He's not good. The facts are there. The facts are there. People lie, numbers don't, right? I'm not going to, you know, people did not like what I was achieving. They didn't like it. And so the reaction was based on fear and resentment because there's people that don't look like me that never got this reaction. There was a guy that ran his mouth about me. Oh, this is outrageous. And he, he came out and they were like, you mate, you're a rapist. And he was blasted like two weeks later and he's got the same treatment as me, but he's not as bad as me. He was drugging and raping, raping people allegedly, right? You don't hear about him in the news. His business partner never got ruined. It's because of who I am. I'm not supposed to be here. I'm not supposed to be one of them. I was never supposed to be one of them. People like me do not get that award. People like me do not succeed in this business. And the thing is, is I was helping other people like me get into the business. So when they talk about change, I was making a real change. A lot of these diversity quotas that they put in are designed to keep them in the positions of power that they have. Because if you make a quota, you're letting people through. You're basically all staying there and you're going, well, yeah, we'll let one through, we'll let two through. That's not how you change things. You dismantle everything is how you change things. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm. And I was a disruptor. I was a dismantler. I was a threat to this very fabric of what it was and they didn't like that people don't like that i think this podcast we've got a good script for a film brother <laughs> all we need is that happy ending i'm telling you getting over this obstacle can you see potentially writing a film about this i've i've written one if you're looking for a big handsome scotsman to play a part mate i'm not you can play That's the that funny Steve you can play the, uh, the the villain Fred <laughs> trust me yeah. <laughs> <That's laughs> <lafunny there>, <laughs> yeah i've 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 written the um i've written the the movie that is about this whole situation it's fictional obviously it's a fictional character and but i've written that i've written other stuff i've been writing it just keeps as i said from being a little boy it just keeps me keeps Same. me sane i put on my wrestling my wwe which i love in the background i just write i just write and look after my kids man we had we you know another thing is you know, we nearly didn't have our baby because of this. Like, we nearly didn't have the baby because we're just like... Your kids nearly never had a father. Yeah, they nearly never had a father. But every time I look at this baby, i got to know that I nearly didn't have the kid because I was just like, how can I bring this kid into this world where I might not be about, but also what life can I give this kid? Like, my other kids have been all right, but now i got nothing. Like, what can I give this kid? So we were very close to not having this kid. Sad, isn't it? It's very sad. Everything you went through to try and, try and reach the cream of the crop, to then thinking you're not good enough, to losing it all, to being through under the bus, to all the accusations, everybody turning their back. Yeah. But f for me, man, it just, it makes you stronger. It makes you stronger to kick on and then you already know the numbers, how to be successful. You've left the blueprint for people. For to people go, behind you. Yeah. I can fucking yeah. do it. They don't want to be sitting here going no, through what you've went no. through but you're clearly strong enough to go through it for yeah, anybody that's watching yeah. that's maybe in the struggle that's maybe think there's no way out what advice would you have for them very cliche is like there's always light there's always light at the end of the darkness do you know what I mean and and 
it's not worth it's not worth ending it all you know I know as I said I now have to look at that kid all the time and know that I nearly didn't have that kid but for me I just have to be the best that I can be for that kid and for my other three boys do you know what I mean I just kind of for me anyone who's thinking about taking a life or anyone who's thinking about harming themselves or anyone that's been through what I've been through, whether they're guilty and want to learn the lesson, but are not giving the being, but are not being given the opportunity to, to say they want to change or whether they're innocent or whether there's somewhere in between, it's like you can change and you can be better and you can be an example for other people and use your experience to show other people the way. I think the first call, phone call we had, I said to you, you've got healthy kids, you've got a missus who loves you, you're already winning. You did say that. Everything else is glitz and glam. Everything else. You did say that. Doesn't really mean fuck all. You're already winning, brother. You did say that. Would you like to finish up on anything? No, man. I don't have any Jerry Springer final thoughts or anything like that. I'm just like, <laughs> I've just enjoyed the chat, man. Likewise. Listen, no. Thanks for coming on today, Thank mate. You, I appreciate that. Yeah. I wish you nothing but greatness and success in the future. I hope everything gets resolved and I'll hopefully get the apology you deserve, brother. Thank you very much. God bless you. Take care, my man.